For more than a decade, Saturdays and Illegal Curve have been synonymous with one another. With insight, analysis, and interviews regarding the Winnipeg Jets, the Manitoba Moose, and all around the NHL, here are Dave Manouk, Ezra Ginsberg, and your host, Drew Mandel. The Illegal Curve Hockey Show starts now. An honest question for both of you gentlemen. How early for a flight do you arrive? Do you arrive an hour early for your flight and just expect international or domestic? Yeah, exactly. Are we talking domestic or international? Because I think if it's international, hour and a half. Okay. And if it's domestic, about three seconds after the plane leaves, is that usually <laughs> what your time frame is, is, is around? I did about once that? miss a flight from Montreal to Winnipeg, and then I had to stay in Montreal for an extra, I think, night or two. So uh, it has happened. But no, today's show started late 100% because of me. I was helping Naomi pack the van. They're heading out to the cottage. I'll be heading out to the cottage after. So that's 100% on me. Uh, I apologize to all of the IC Nation. Okay, fair enough. As long as he paid penance, and I'm sure you're going to pay more penance when you show up there two hours after your wife has arrived, and then she just turns the children over to you and says, here, deal with these for the next little while. It's going to happen. I know it's going to happen. I've been there myself. Dave, good morning to you. You have no excuse whatsoever. At least Ginsburg's got a, a family obligation that, that held him up. You're just irresponsible. Yeah, that, that's fair. I mean, I was getting a little worried because uh, cause, uh, I the big guy is usually at my house a little bit earlier, and usually he sends me a text, give me some sort of indication as to when he will be here, and he had not. So I was I was looking out, I was looking forlornly out the door, saying, "Ezzy, Ezzy." Every car drove by, "Ezzy," but it wasn't him. I strolled in at about like eight fifty six, and then yeah. we usually get a text from Drew around like eight fifty eight. Uh, but yeah, this is 100% my fault, guys. I got to step my game up. I obviously haven't elevated my game. There was no pushback for me. No pushback whatsoever. And uh, I'll call you out for it. Hopefully you won't take it too personally and uh, and go a little bit uh, cuckoo banana puffs. But nonetheless, we say good morning, Winnipeg. Good morning, Manitoba. And for all those joining us live this morning on our YouTube channel and all of our social media platforms, good morning, universe, and welcome to the Illegal Curve Hockey Show with Dave Manu with Ezra Ginsburg. I'm your host, Rumendell, here for the next couple hours. Talk about the Winnipeg Jets. By the way, all the people that drew that I'm highlighting yeah. are people that I met on Tuesdays, at Tuesdays, Kenny and Rennie season wrap-up. So what? Kim Sawchuk, Rob Somerville, uh, Spency was not there as far as I could tell. Donnie Boy I met because I delivered his merch. Spency was actually filling up the hot tub in Sage Creek. You know, I mean, it's it's. I'm just saying that it was nice to finally put a, a, a face to some names, usernames, I should say, of folks who uh, support the various shows here in Winnipeg, being ours, Kenny and Rennie, and of course, Winnipeg Sports Talk. So it was really nice to get a chance to meet everybody on Tuesday night. I just want to throw that in because it was uh, Ken and Sean were uh, through a great, uh, great evening. A lot of people were, were in attendance. The only people that were disappointingly missing, with good reason, as was under the weather, he didn't want to make anybody sick, potentially, and Drew had family obligations, so he couldn't be there. But I will say... I really should have bought like cardboard cutouts of the two of you because when people see me, they're not certain when, you know, they think of us as a trio. We're, we're a tripod. So me by myself, I'm just some bozo who's wearing an illegal career bat. Maybe I'm support, supporting wearing the merch. You, of course, if I have the three, two of you on either side, then we're a team. There you go. As long as Jet Oil Tom. We should just walk around with our name tags, like uh, like uh, our usernames uh, like, uh, that are on the screen so that people would be able to recognize us. Uh, yes, unfortunately, uh, my wife was out of town, so I was on kid duty. Uh, but I heard it was a great party. It looked like a great party. So kudos uh, to uh, Sean, because I'm sure he did all the legwork. And Kenny, who was there getting all the accolades for being the real celebrity of the group. And Dave there representing IC. It looked like a, a fun time was had. Great to see like Kevin O and, and Rick Ralph and some of the old TSN 1290 personalities but yeah echo what drew said unfortunately i couldn't make it um but hopefully we'll you know be able to attend the next one and uh shout out to kenny and rennie doing an awesome job all year long on the post game shows and obviously with all of their coverage for Sportsnet. so i'm sure we're gonna have an opportunity though to you know kick a couple back at some point on a patio i mean it's tough to keep up with kenny though kenny's on the like once it hits like june kenny's on the golf course like every single day so got to catch him when he's not golfing well you know i was texting him i, I sent him a text on tuesday saying sorry i'm not gonna be able to make it but i said let's you know hit up uh, let's get let's get a game in and he definitely responded with a bit of a brush off about you know me joining the manitoba golf tour i was like wow yeah, yeah we'll, we'll see you know if, if he gets low enough on the list after he goes through everybody else maybe i'll i'll, I'll get a, a text and see if i can join him last minute but it certainly didn't feel like an effusive <laughs> yeah let, let, let's do it up let, let, let's get it together let's tip a few back 
but Kenny's a serious golfer and you know, we're not that serious people. So that's okay. I forgive you, Kenny. I still love you. Nonetheless. Uh, let's get talking about the Winnipeg jets. Really not a ton going on. Uh, except for Leon Gavonke really torching the franchise on his way out of town. Hopefully that Google translation was, uh, I worked my ass off, not I tore my ass open for them. (laughs) Who's got the best German amongst the three of us? Uh, I don't think any of us, but I I could count. I'll be honest. I tore my ass open for them. It is a great turn of phrase that I, uh, you know, obviously a little bit vulgar and maybe a little bit uh, painful by the sounds of it. But uh, if you really want to, you know, instead of saying, you know, I really worked hard. I think from now on, I'm going to say I tore my ass open today at the office. But then just always make sure you have a little proviso explaining that that's actually the German translation of I worked my ass off. That's right. That's that's fair. Otherwise, I might be get called in in front of HR yet again for yet another reason, I'm sure, uh, for uh, in a Drew, I see this behavior. Behavior. Drew, are we uh, really it, leading with the Leon Gavonke no, German story? Like, I thought 100% we'd be leading off with Clayton Keller's dad's email, uh, pardon me, Twitter account being hacked and the Arizona Coyotes' Twitter account being completely unhinged. I'm not sure if you guys have been or anybody I watching have. right now or listening on the podcast has been following the, the Coyotes' Twitter account, but like, what an embarrassment. Like, who's running that an account? Like, a seven year old child? <laughs> it is embarrassing that this is allegedly a pro sports franchise putting out a, a tweet poll, a Twitter poll saying, where should we, where should we next look to play and, and, and host our games? Uh, it really is. It's just an embarrassment for the entire NHL, but we know that the NHL uh, doesn't. I mean, ever... also worth noting, though, it's not like hockey operations of running the social media. People need to, like, you know. I mean, the LA Kings. The LA Kings have the best social media in my did mind. You, there. Did you, Dave? Did you did you see Gary Bettman on with John Shannon? Um, I didn't. I saw that he was on. I didn't actually listen to it though. And Bob McCallum, like on their podcast, like he was talking about the strength of the Phoenix market. I, I like. I was like, is this two thousand and seven? Like, what year <laughs> are we in now? You know, Bettman's still talking about how yes, yeah, like Phoenix and Arizona. Yeah, it's a big market, but it's like. <laughs> Like, let it go, man. Move the team already. Like, I'm not sure, you know, where the team is going to move, but it's unbelievable how Gary Bettman is still talking about Phoenix as as there's this, like, such possibility for this franchise. Like, it hasn't worked. It never worked. I mean, maybe the first three or four seasons were good when you had Jeremy Roenick and Teppo Newman in there, right? But, I mean, it's, it's time to move on. Well, it's just, I mean, it, it is just embarrassing, but, uh, you know, whatever. It's, uh, you know, the number of days and weeks and months that we spent cataloging drama in the desert and watching mm-hmm. Glendale City Council meetings with uh, uh, Councillor Phil Lieberman, may he rest in peace, and little Logan, who's now a divorced dad of two. Uh, you oh, know, Drew did a deep dive. <laughs> that's right. You know, things of that nature, we don't need to rehash. Uh, little Logan's days. home just foreclosed in, in the Phoenix area. <laughs> That's right. Little little Logan went under. His mortgage was underwater in the 2008 housing collapse uh, in in the in the in the Glendale area. Uh, in any event, if you don't know what we're talking about, consider yourself better off about all of that because it was a dark time that we all uh, experienced. I don't think we want to experience again. And no, we're not going to start with Leon Gavonke, but his comments, in case you missed them, they're available on illegalcurve.com. Uh, nonetheless, when he signed in Germany, uh, he did not. Uh, he he. Left Left with br- the bridges being burnt between him and the Jets organization, uh, not a happy camper in saying that the uh, in his relationship with the Jets organization, and he made that clear in that interview in German. So we have to rely on Google Translate for that, but it's on illegalcurve.com. Uh, let, let's start with the Jets and the Big Four because those are the Big Four questions that are going to dominate this off season, and that, of course, is the future status of. Uh, Pierre-Luc Dubois, Mark Scheifele, Blake Wheeler, and Connor Hellebuck. We sit here today, we are about five weeks, I think it's almost five weeks to the day before the NHL draft, uh, and then about you know five and a half weeks or six weeks until the start of free agency. So you know that the time is rapidly approaching uh, with regard to when sort of those big moves begin to happen in the NHL. You know, Now that you're into the conference finals, the end of the season is in sight, And the silly season will quickly ramp up in earnest. So I thought today we'll do a little thing that we do usually at the start of the season. And let's do a little over-under. A little bit of over-under with regard to those four big Jets names. And we'll go one at a time. And I'll hear your guys' opinions on what you think the future state of Pierre-Luc Dubois, Connor Halibut, Mark Scheifele, and Blake Wheeler will be with this Jets organization. We'll start with Pierre-Luc Dubois, gentlemen. Over or under 80% that 
that the Jets trade him before the start of the 23-24 season. Couldn't you just say, will the Jets trade Dubois before the start of the 23-24 season? Yes I, or no? I'm not I, sure if that needs an over-under. but It does need an over-under. I need to know how – I mean, I'm, I'm setting the line at 80%, so I want to see how confident you are with your opinion. I don't want any hedging. I want 80% is a pretty high number. If you say it's over 80%, then you're saying that, you know, you are strongly in the camp that the Jets are going to trade sure. for Luke Dubois. It's over. I mean, we talked about this two weeks ago, right? Drew, you asked a similar question in terms of the core four, you know, which of these four players did we think would be moved first, right? And I think we all agreed it was going to be a Pierre Luke Dubois. I'm pretty adamant that it is going to be PLD. So yeah, it's pretty easy one there for me, guys. Like, I just don't know how you if if you're not and we all agree the Jets are not rebuilding like there's no question that you know that's not going to happen this year everything that Kevin Shevel Dayoff said everything that you know players like Kyle Connor and Connor Hellebuck said I mean there's just no I think appetite in this Jets organization right now so I don't know how you hold on to Pierre Luc Dubois when you're going for the playoffs and then trade him at the trade deadline I just don't see that so I do think Pierre Luc Dubois is going to be traded before next season starts. And it could be as early as the draft, to be honest with you. Well, so you mentioned the draft. And so if you want to, if history is a past indicator of future activity, Jacob Truba was traded to the New York Rangers on June 17th, 2019, which would have been about, you know, let's say 10 or so days probably before that year's uh, draft. I don't know exactly know when the 2019 draft was. I can look it up, but let's assume that the draft was at its usual time. It would have time. been, yeah, it would have been the usual time because yeah. that was before COVID. That's right. right. It was pre-COVID, yeah. so the schedule hadn't gone out of whack at that point in time. So that, you know, if, if you're looking at, at that as a, as, a, as a, you know, as a timeline that could be followed for a Pierre-Luc Dubois trade, that is that is where uh, the the time on the calendar where Truba is traded. But Dave, I'll, I'll I'll see the same question to you. We've seen a couple of comments in the chat where uh, I think it was Kenny's water bottle who said that uh, he thinks that Pierre Luc Dubois signs his con his qualifying offer here in Winnipeg, which would keep him around or certainly could keep him around for another year before unrestricted free agency. Bailey thinks he doesn't get moved till the trade deadline. So same question to you. As he says, over. What do you say? I think you have to say over. I think that, you know, first of all, I don't think it's going to be soon though. Of course, watch it up in like the next five minutes, but like, <laughs> I, I don't think, I don't think it'll be soon because um, I think that Kevin Shovel day off. And I had someone ask me this question on Twitter, but I think what Kevin Shovel day off is doing is trying to create distance between those end of season media availabilities and looking like he's desperate, looking like he's trying to trying to make something happen to get out of an al unpalatable situation. So I, I suspect as you've just illustrated, Drew, Similar with Jacob Truba, because I mean, again, it's the hockey world. These guys are like, it's like high school. Everybody chit chats, everybody gossips. So there's very few secrets in, 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 in te with teams around the league. Everybody seems to know everything. So I think what they'll do is try and create a little distance as they did previously. But no, my, my expectation is you can't have the uncertainty. You say to Pierre-Luc Dubois, after he's had some time and space, are you going to sign a long-term extension here in Winnipeg? If the answer on July or not July 1st, but if the answer is still no, then the answer, then you can't afford to, I mean, you can afford to keep him, and then you could trade him, and he'll still be a, a good asset, but no, I mean, and the reason why you do that with Truba is you want to have certainty, right? You, you've obviously had your amateur scouting meetings. You already know roughly what your, what your order is going to look like, but you still have to be able to say, okay, we now have, you know, a fifth overall pick. We now have a, 10th overall pick. Like, how does that impact our, our board a little bit? So I, I, I would think a player like Pierre-Luc Dubois does get moved unless he's prepared to to sign for a long-term deal. If he's signing long-term, as he, then, then you're not dealing him because he's a, you know, a bona fide, you know, one number one center. And, you know, you don't, you don't turn your nose up on those, on those types of players. He had an excellent season for the Winnipeg Jets. So I think if you can sign him to a long-term deal, that makes sense for your organization then I think you do it because he's young and he's, you know, someone that you want to take. And when I say long-term, it doesn't have to be eight years. You know, you, I'm sure the Jets would be happy to get a five-year deal out of Pierre-Luc Dubois. But I think you need to know, because look, at the end of the day, guys, at, ultimately this is a second overall pick that you had Patrick Line. And if you are going to turn that around and trade Pierre-Luc Dubois and you're going to get a, some magic beans, like those have to be pretty damn good magic beans, as he, because you can't afford to say we turned a 2016 second rounder who could, you know, 
scored 50 goals consistently every year to X, Y, or Z, which really doesn't amount to the same thing. Right. And, and, you know, going back to, you know, the, how, how sure we are, whether we're above 80% or whatever, that Dubois is going to be traded before the 23, 24 season starts. I think that is the big wild card here because everything that we've heard in the media is that Pierre-Luc Dubois wants out, right? That he wants to play in Montreal, not that he wants to play in Anaheim, not that he wants to play in San Jose, that he wants to play in Montreal, but we don't know if anything has changed. The only thing I would like, Dave makes a good point. Yeah. If you, if you can sign Pierre-Luc Dubois to a five-year deal, six-year deal, seven-year deal, eight-year deal, whatever, I think, you know, Chevy and the True North organization will do that, but I just don't know, like, what indication is there that a long-term contract is coming? I just don't know, right? I mean, that's the big wild card. Has anything changed in the last, you know, two or three months? Because if you go back two or three months, it seemed like the writing was on the wall and that Pierre-Luc Dubois was going to be a member of the Montreal Canadiens eventually, right? So mm-hmm. I think that is the big wild card. And then, you know, I don't think you can separate Dubois and Shifley. And I'm not sure, Drew, if you want to get into Shifley next. But, I mean, if the intention, Dave, is to trade Shifley, can you trade two of your top centers? Like, I, you just don't see that happen very often in the NHL. So you wonder maybe, you know, if something has changed there and, you know, Dubois knows that the Jets are going to move on from Shifley and maybe that app opens up a little bit more cap room because you got to think Dubois is looking for – you know, in the neighborhood of eight and a half to nine million a year. I think that'd be fair to say. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm sure that's somewhere where around where the dollar is. I mean, I'm we can get into Shifley. Uh, sure, let's get into Shifley. And, and the question I had the, the same over under with him, uh, you know, so the over under I had on, on Mark Shifley is 60% that the Jets trade him. And, uh, you know, if you don't mind me going and expressing my opinion here, and thank you, Dave, uh, I, I don't think the Jets trade Mark Shifley. I think that the Jets actually look to sign Mark Shifley to a contract extension. That would be what I would expect the team to do. I think that they, for whatever reason, and you know, we know that they sort of have some bizarre loyalties and fall in love with, with certain players and can't see the franchise existing without some of these guys. I think Mark Shifley, and I'm being a little bit tongue in cheek when I say that, of course, but I think Mark Shifley is one of those guys. So I would not be surprised if during training camp, which is usually where the Jets sign uh, a guy who's that, you know, one year out from free agency, uh, that, that these, you know, historically that's where they they've done. So I would not be surprised if the Jets sign, uh, Mark Shifley to a contract extension, uh, you know, before the start of next season, I don't think he gets traded. So on my own over under, I would say it's actually going to be under, but I certainly, I don't have any particular insight into that or any particular, uh, knowledge that that's the uh, team's course of action. That's strictly my opinion based on, sort of a reading of the past activities and a little bit of reading of the uh, magic beans you just mentioned there, uh, there as a. Yeah, no, Dave mentioned the magic beans. I'll, I'll take any type of beans, lima, whatever, uh, black beans, but. Your I mean, mushroom I, dispensary it, got shut down, by the way. Did it actually already get shut down? Yeah, it got shut down yesterday. I, it's funny that you mentioned that because I, I saw that article and I was like, when did that become legal? So obviously it wasn't <laughs> it wasn't legal. And it I'm going to have to get my uh, psilocybin from another source. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, we'll, we'll figure it out. I think there's enough in the city to go around, right? Obviously, I'm talking about for my pizza, not so I can hallucinate, boys. Come on. But um, <clears throat> obviously, Dave and I have both have hoarse voices uh, today. We've been talking too much, I think, before the show started. But I mean, look at Drew. You're not wrong. Like, I I think the likelihood of Shifley being traded is 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 less than Dubois. And I think that you know, if you want to start talking about you know what a Shifley contract would look like, I mean, I think it would be very interesting because I think we all agree he's due for a raise, especially coming off of a 42 goal season. Even though if you know he wasn't that good defensively, and you know we could have that conversation as well because I still think you know, Shifley struggles on the defensive side of the game, but no like, is he an $8 million a year player? Is he a $9 million a year player? I'm sure his agent would ask for 9 million, but if you're Kevin Shevel day off, are you prepared to give, you know, Mark Shifley five or six years at $9 million a year? Like he's 30 years old. I don't think that contract is going to look that great um, when he's 34 or 35 years old. I'm not saying that, you know, Shifley is in the last two or three years of his contract. I just think, <clears throat> you know, the, the difference in age, between Dubois and Shifley is significant. So I think it's less likely that Shifley is moved. And I think, you know, when you're talking about next year's trade deadline, I think it makes a lot more sense for Shifley to be traded before next year's trade deadline if you're not going to be a playoff team or if you know that you're not, 
you know, obviously, you know, Shifley's a guy that needs a contract, a different type of contract, but I just think trading Pierre-Luc Dubois makes a lot more sense where this club is at right now. Well, you know, the one thing you have to factor in is you're not trading away all your centers because as someone just pointed out, is Adam Lowry now going to be your number one center? Brad He's Lambert. Not. Brad Lambert. Well, I mean, that's, and that's a good point. And we'll talk about that. I'm sure later in the show, Drew, but no, I mean, Brad Lambert could be a center. And that's something that obviously, you know, we, I talked to Zinger on Thursday and we heard from Mark Morrison and obviously he's playing center in Seattle and, and thriving in that opportunity. It's a little different of a jump to make it to the I NHL know. and be a center. And I know you know that, but anyways, the point is you're not trading away Mark Shifley and Pierre-Luc Dubois. You don't have the center depth in the organization to, to sustain that. Uh, unless you're going to get back as he two two top uh, defensemen and you're just going to be a lockdown team, score one goal, let Connor Hellebuck make every save and have a defense like, you know, Vegas, for example, that it, it makes it difficult to, on other teams to penetrate. But no, quite frankly, you can't, you can't trade away both uh, Pierre-Luc Dubois and Mark Shifley. You just can't. And I know Mark Shifley defensively hasn't been good. And I've been on the, Mark Shifley doesn't need to spend time with his skills coach, Adam Oates anymore. He needs to spend time with, you know, Andre Kopitar and Patrice Bergeron it, it, learning more of a defensive element to his game. I mean, look, no player. I mean, Mark Shifley, let's, you're a student of the game, right? If you're a student of the game, what did Steve Eisenman do? Steve Eisenman is his favorite player. Steve Eisenman changed his game. Steve Eisenman was an offensive player who became better defensively. And what happened in Detroit? They started winning Stanley Cups. Now, obviously, it wasn't only because of a guy named Steve Eisenman, but that helped. That went a long way in changing things. So, look, I do think Mark Shifley is a guy you can build a team around. I just don't think this version of Mark Shifley is a guy sure. you can do it. I think you well, need to see some changes to his game. So, for me, I think Mark Shifley could get a good contract. I just think that it has to be instilled in him that he needs to change elements of his game in order to be the type of player the Jets need. Because it's not about, again, hockey, the ultimate team sport. You score 42 goals. That's fantastic for you. It's important for the team but it's a team game and you can't be defensively irresponsible and, and, and cause you're a liability overall. And that's, and that's the problem with Shifley. And that's why he got moved to the wing, right? He didn't get moved to the wing because he was a, a great center who was uh, defensively responsible. So I think that's one of the things that he has to change in his game. He has to make a commitment. Like if the team is going to say, we're going to make a commitment to you and we're going to pay you $8 million, $9 million a season. But part of that comes with the understanding that your game has to change in order for it to benefit the team. None of us know if Shifley is going to be traded. I, I think that there's a good chance that he will be traded considering his contract, Dave. I think we all agree on that. But I think the question, I agree with you, he definitely does. I, I guess the question I would ask on that is, at 30 years old, like why hasn't he done it by now? Right, like th this is not a guy who's been in the league for two or three years. This is a guy who's been in the league for eight or nine years. And I think the bigger question you have to ask is, when you sign that contract with Shifley in 2015 or 2016, giving him the eight-year deal, and yes, he if you look at it on an average annual value, he should probably be closer to an $8 million a year player or maybe even higher. But I think the question you have to ask is, like, you were, you're at where you are right now, and you had Shifley as a big part of that core, along with Blake Wheeler and Kyle Connor, Nick Ehlers. We all know the, the core. Connor Hellbuck, Josh Morrissey. What makes you think that Shifley is the guy to give a seven- or eight-year deal, and he's the guy that you want to be at, right in the middle of that core? That's the question I think you have to ask. And I, don't, I, I think you know, there's a lot of questions that come up as part of that, right? Like, again, I think you know, Shifley's got a good four or five years left in him, maybe even longer but, I mean, is this a guy that you want to sign to a seven- or eight-year deal? Probably around $9 million a year. Or at the very least, it's going to be $8 million a year, right? And you do have, you know, other players coming up through the system. But you definitely do not have anybody who's going to be able to replace Shifley in the next two or three years. So you'd have to think, you know, a center would be coming back in a Shifley trade. Or you're obviously going to promote someone else within your organization. I don't know if that's going to be Cole Perfetti. But I think that's the big question here, guys, is, you know... Is, is Mark Shifley the guy you want to trust to, to take you to the promised land? And, and I think there's a lot of, you can make a strong argument that Shifley's not a guy that's going to lead you to a Stanley Cup. Okay, Let's so hold on, hold on. No, 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 let me just, sorry, Teddy. I'm going to just quickly finish my point because, Drew, I had some people saying, wake up, wake up, even though it's not Kenny and Rennie. But I want to make the last observation. So people ask me, what makes you a guy change? So quickly, doing some research, Steve Eiserman. Start joined the NHL in 1983. He was a 137-point player in 92-93. 
in 93, when Scotty Bowman took over, told me it changed his style of game. That's when it took effect. So it took Steve Eisenman, Hall of Famer, 10 years before he was prepared to make an adjustment in his game and play a game that was more conducive for the team to win than for him to be a individually a star in the NHL. All so, due respect yeah. to Mark Scheifele, though, Dave, he's not Steve I'm not, Eiserman, I'm not okay? suggesting other. I'm not suggesting otherwise, but people are saying, can a guy change his, can a cat change its stripes? And I'm just saying it took Steve Eiserman 10 years in order to do so. Well, Ted Wyman, let's bring him in, sports editor of the Winnipeg Sun. Good morning, Ted. Can a cat change its stripes? Is, is Mark Scheifele, you know, just going to be what he is and the Winnipeg Jets will either live with it or does he have the ability to change his his on-ice performance and his on-ice shortcomings? And then what would you do with Mark Shifley this summer? That's sort of the, the, the subject matter along with some of the other of the big four that the Jets are, that we're discussing. Right. Well, good morning, guys. Great to see you again. As always, a pleasure to be on the show. Um, honestly, I think it's, uh, it's a really good question. I, I imagine you already talked about this, Dave. I saw you at the Kenny and Rennie thing the other day and that all the fans there, that's all they wanted to talk about. Like every single person that came up to me, what's going to happen with Shifley and Wheeler. And it's obviously on the minds of everybody in this city. So can a cat change its stripes in this, in this case, I don't see why you would believe it would happen. I mean, the, the guy's been around for the entire length of time that the Jets have been here, basically. And he's, uh, you know, he, he's kind of, in some ways, I thought he improved for a while, but then he kind of started to regress to some of the things that aren't so good, some of the habits. And um, I think when you read the writing, uh, you know, between the lines uh, in last season, at the end of the season, much of this season, there's a problem with him. And, and I think there's a problem with him in terms of his teammates and that kind of situation. And, and I think in some cases, you just have to remove a player from it to really move forward as a group. And so no matter the, that he can get 40 goals in a season, which is great, he had a – and I don't think very many people think he had a, a really great season, even though he had over 40 goals, because of other – shortcomings because of mm -hmm. long periods where he disappeared but you do get some real value out of him but then you have to weigh what's the other side of this and i i personally believe that a trade of mark shifley is paramount to the jets moving forward and and taking big steps as an organization in the coming years well let me, let me sorry as i know you were going to go next let me ask you this ted you know, knowing the loyalty that this team has to certain players that this franchise has. And GMs. I mean, and GMs, <laughs> of course. And, and every, you know, they, they sort of get put blinders on when it comes to certain people within the organization, on the ice, off the ice. Do you see any indication that the team is, is capable of doing a, a truthful evaluation of their players and their roster and their organization? Yeah, I do think so. I think capable, yes. There, there may be some reluctance to make those kind of moves. I mean, there is another side to this, guys, and there always has been, and that's that it's not that easy to get guys to sign long-term to stay in Winnipeg. We've seen it with several really good players that they've had to let go, and it's probably going to happen again with Pierre-Luc Dubois. So when, you've got, when you do find guys that will sign long-term and stay, like Wheeler, like Shifley, like Morrissey, like Connor, it's really important. I mean, it's the lifeblood of this organization. But at some point, you have to take a hard look at, is it damaging your organization as well? And certain players, it seems like, may have overstayed their welcome here in terms of, of how this organization can grow as a team. They're just, you know, they have these shortcomings like completely disappearing in the last game of the playoffs this year and disappearing for 15 games during the regular season when they could have been battling for first place. And you wonder where that comes from. You know, it, 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 it has to be somewhat of a leadership issue. It has to be, and maybe not the guys that are wearing the A's, but the guys that have been in the room for as long as they have and, and maybe aren't that willing to change their ways. I mean, you got to look at something. Something has to be causing this team to do what it does. And it just makes sense 
to make some changes at some point. And I think this is that pivotal year. The Shifley situation to me is very complicated just because they most likely do have to trade Pierre-Luc Dubois if they want to get value for him before he becomes an unrestricted free agent in a year. So because you have to do that, it makes it a lot harder to say, yeah, we're going to trade our other top center as well. But there's a lot of players out there. There's a lot of teams that are talking about trades and in, and big name players can be moved in trades, as we saw last year with Matthew Kachuk and the Calgary Flames getting pretty good players in return. I mean, not as good as Kachuk, but, <laughs> but pretty good. Um, and, and so I think you have to look at the possibilities of, of real blockbusters here because there is no appetite in Winnipeg whatsoever for a rebuild. That's not going to work with their marketing campaign that they're working on right now with their issue selling tickets last season, a rebuild would be disastrous. And I think those can't be separated, right, Ted? Like there, like there have been three coaches for this current core, right? Like you've had Paul Maurice, you've had Dave Lauer, you've had Rick Bonus. So I think now the spotlight is on the players. They're the ones that play the game. They're the ones that have to, you know, find a way to push back as Rick Bonus talked about and get past the, that first round hurdle, right? So I, I don't think you can separate the two because they want to go for it now. Um, I mean, you'd think it would be the opposite, right? You would think that, no, if you're not going to go in for it, you would trade these guys. But I think that's what's going to complicate things. Like you said, because the Jets have never attracted you know, uh, you know the the top end UFAs, unless you consider Oli Yokin and Dmitry Kulikov high end <laughs> UFAs. Which Ted, last time I checked, I don't think you do consider those guys high end UFAs. But I think that's what's going to complicate things for Chevy and his management group, right? It's that you know you're you're going to have to really nail these trades, and Chevy has nailed a lot of the trades. I think you know there there are exceptions, right, to to that. But I think when you look at Jacob Truba, or you know you look at Andrew Kopp, or even going all the way back to Evander Kane which I think was Chevy's first big trade, right? He has done well, but just getting away from Shifley and, and Dubois for a second, you know, Connor Hellebuck to me, I, I think it's fat. All four players are fascinating, right? Like even looking at, you know, Blake Wheeler, like what can you get back for him? Are you going to have to retain half of his salary? Because I think you'd agree out of the co those core four players, I mean, Wheeler, his trade value is the, the least, right? Or the lowest. But when you're talking about Connor Hellebuck, you know, it's crazy season and I'm sure, you were talking to a bunch of fans at the Kenny and Rennie year ender, you know, you're already hearing, okay, what can the jets get from the New Jersey devils? Can they get yes for Brad? Can they get a first round pick? What could the jets get from the red wings for Connor Hellebuck, obviously being for Michigan, but I, I just don't see how you trade Connor Hellebuck. If you're going for it, how do you trade your best player? Well, if you're going for it, as if you're talking about going for it next year, one year with all these guys on expiring contracts, well, then, you know, you've made your decision. <laughs> you're just flat out going for it and you're going to keep everybody. And then you just deal with what you deal with at the end. I mean, if you really feel that's your only chance or that's your best chance to win the cup, then maybe that is what you do, but it would really hurt you for the future. So that's why I see them making moves like they would now. And, and it's just logical in my mind that if these other players are being moved, if you're literally, you know, pretty much, resigned to the fact that Wheeler's not going to be here next year. You're talking about trading Shifley. You don't think you're going to be able to sign Dubois and you need to be able to get what you can for him at the moment. Then Hellebuck too. I mean, you can't, like, he's he's not going to want to be here for next season if all those guys have been moved out. And he's, you know, I guess he doesn't get to have that choice, but he's certainly not going to be thinking about signing long-term in that case. And so there's another guy that you can move. And I'll tell you, the value for him is incredibly high. And it, it's, it's hard to, you're, you're not getting a one for one for an elite forward, although you really should. I mean, realistically, it just doesn't work that way with trades, it doesn't seem. But if but, that was the case, Ted, then I think Chevy would have moved Dubois for Nick Suzuki, right? Well, sure. But I, I, I mean, obviously contracts and everything come into it. I was more referring as to a goalie, like no matter how good Connor Hellman sure. is, he's a one-time Vezina winner, three-time nominee. I don't think you can trade him for, you know, with one year left on his contract for, you know, what he's really worth, which would be an elite forward or an elite defenseman. He's an elite goalie. That's what you should be getting back. Just doesn't seem to work that way. But, uh, you know, that if you can get maximum value for him, then you've got to do it. Uh, and, and I think there's 
opportunities there for a lot of value with all these guys. I don't know what you can get for Wheeler. Like you said, I've heard people say they might have to eat four million and you know, throw something into the deal to get the other team to take it. And it seems wrong to me because Blake Wheeler actually didn't have a bad season. He had 61 points. He didn't even play every game. Uh, You know, he was pretty good in the playoffs. I thought he was one of their better players in a lot of the games. So um, it's, you'd think that a guy like that would be worth something, but we know that when you back, you know, when you front load these uh, contracts to get the best years out of a guy, then you're going to have to live with some a situation like this. They knew it all along, but it's it's a cumbersome contract. There's just no doubt about it. And a buyout is possible too, I suppose. Mm-hmm. And if he, like for him to get a buyout, get some money out of the Jets and then sign another deal somewhere would be ideal, you would think. Yeah, the buyout is is the one that I think makes the most sense because you don't have to give up an asset or retain any you know retain any money. The cap hit is two point seven five million this year and next. You don't love it, but you know it, it's certainly doable. You'd rather do that than have to eat fifty percent and give up an asset or something and get you know whatever you get in return. I think you'd re- you don't want to. I don't think you want to venture down that road where having to give up the player and something else to probably get a minimal return because I don't think you're that. Uh, that desperate to get it off the books entirely a buyout is, is just you know a, a bit of a two-year hit to your point there Ted and I also think guys you know it, it speaks to what I was talking about in the Shifley situation and that's that Blake Wheeler's been the leader of this team for a long time and when we went and did the player ending availabilities this year you had guys like Kyle Connor mm-hmm. and uh, and Adam Lowry and various other players saying he's still the captain in our eyes he's still the captain Mm-hmm. Well, I don't think him being the captain has worked. Uh, and I think a lot of people would agree with me. So if you're going to have him still in the room and not be captain anymore, even though, and then and have the players still look at him as a captain, that's still not going to work. So I think it's, it's it, no matter how many points he had this year, no matter how much influence he's had, no, how, no matter how important he's been to this organization in his time here, it's time to move on from Blake Wheeler. However, whatever the means are, they have to make that move. Saturday morning, you're watching the Illegal Curve Hockey Show. We're live on all of our social media platforms. Ted Wyman, sports editor of the Winnipeg Sun, is our guest here on the program. Well, Ted, you you led me into my question. <clears throat> I've lost my voice. You have a Less- lozenge you can provide. That, that, that <laughs> was the question. Yeah. Is, you're you talking to a prepubescent Dave Manu, by the way. Do you have, any, do you have any? I had too, too much conversation, too many conversations on Tuesday night, I officially lost my voice. But uh, no, Ted, you know, that that leads me into my question because it's about leadership. It's about this idea of leadership. And I agree with you. Like when we were hearing those end of season media availabilities and I understand it, hockey's all about loyalty. Hockey's all about brotherhood. So none of these guys want to look disloyal. You know, when Blake Wheeler is still in the room, nobody, everybody can say, I want to step up and take a role on this team. But nobody's going to say, I want to be captain when the guy who was captain for years is right beside you. In right. that room, that's a problem, and that's a that's a team created problem because they didn't want to make a different decision. But to me, and and leading it, you know, obviously, I, I we know your thoughts. But how can they? How can you have a another situation? And is a captain extremely necessary? There's teams that don't have captains right now. But how does Josh Morrissey, Adam Lowry, one of those two? Because those those are really the two guys we think are going to ultimately be named. It's not going to be safely. Team. <laughs> Not York, actually, no. It'll be it'll be Adam Lowry or 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 or, um, or Josh Morrissey, but really, how can you continue to maintain Blake Wheeler in this lineup when those guys refuse no. to accept any sort of title? Because again, like I said, the end of season, they're like, he's our leader, he's our leader, he's our leader. Okay, well, it doesn't work that way. No, you you just can't, Dave. You just can't. I I I just don't see how that would work at all. I, it didn't work this year. It's it, the, the guys still thought of him as the captain. So whatever, you know, and, and we, we kind of saw that there's some resistance to uh, some of the ways and, and words that uh, Rick Bonus has for that hockey team too, right? We saw that at the end of the year. So now it comes out at the end of the year that they were still following Blake. Well, that's a bit of a thumbing of the nose at the coach, isn't it? Because he's the guy that came in and said, I recognize that one of the problems with this team is that this captain is having a bad influence. So I'm not going to have him be the captain anymore. But then the players still treat him like the captain. So, I mean, I, I can't predict 
exactly what the Winnipeg Jets will do. And I can't predict, you know, through that loyalty that you guys talk about. But I'm saying right now, what they should do is make sure that Blake Wheeler is moving on this year so that this team can grow in a different direction. I don't know how it can happen any other way. And then you do have Adam Lowry or Josh Morrissey as your captain. And you have a different voice. And you have a different style of player. And all those things leading the way. And then you start to grow again. Because I don't see growth with this team. It's stagnancy ever since 2018 playoffs. And and that's been a long time now. You know, Ted, you, you mentioned... In sort of in the previous answer, Rick Bonus and his end of season comments, which of course set the hockey world on fire for a little while there. The Jets seem to be of the opinion that they can just let time heal the wound and come back in September and all will be hunky dory again. Do you think that's uh, fool's gold that they're they're hoping for? Because y- y- you know his comments, the incendiary nature of them, and then the players pushing back as aggressively as they did seems to me that that is not going to be a bridge that's easily rebuilt, yet the organization seems to think that it won't be an issue whatsoever. I guess it depends how many players in that room hold grudges, doesn't it, Drew? I mean, like, I would hope that they're all mature enough to self-reflect and say, well, you know what? He was kind of (laughs) right. And maybe we should be redoubling our efforts to to, to do better. You're asking professional athletes to check their ego. <laughs> it's a tough one, but you know, I w- I was very disappointed, like a lot of other people were, when there were no players that came forward and said anything like that after the season. They all just said he shouldn't have said it. Not, mm-hmm. not. I am really upset that our coach felt that way. You know, like not. It, it wasn't. It was, it was never that. It was never. I'm upset that he felt that way. It's I'm upset that he said it. Mm-hmm. And and I think that was a pretty indicative. And yeah, you might be right. There, there there could be an issue with that. But I mean, like, what's Bones known for, right? He's known for being a straight shooter. He's known for telling it like it is and going into that room and just saying, guys, this is the way it is. It seems in this case, he didn't at the end of the game. And he did go into the media room and he did lose his temper for a minute, you know, lose his composure and say some things. But he was his wearing his heart on his sleeve. He's saying exactly what he really believed, and and in the moment. And to me, that was very refreshing. To be totally honest, um, and yeah, I, I think their reaction to it is just another indication that maybe they're not the most coachable team that there ever was. And uh, and and we'll see if they can do their best this off season to come back and be more coachable next year. And maybe I think taking a couple of the players we've talked about out of the mix will make that easier. So Ted, just getting away from the Jets talk here for a second. I mean, it is going to come full circle because my question is going to involve the Jets 1.0 and where they relocated, of course, to the (laughs) greater Glendale Phoenix area. uh, Because how much core four talk can we really, I I, I, will we'll be talking about this for weeks leading up to the draft and, and beyond, but I mean, you've covered, you've been in sports journalism for a long time. I mean, you've, you've gone through, I mean, all of these different owners, the NHL owning the Arizona Coyotes, but like, I was joking with Dave and Drew at the top of the show. Like, it just seems like everything is unhinged, including the Coyotes Twitter account, which I'm sure that you've seen. I don't know who's running that. If it's chat GPT, if it's a (laughs) seven-year-old, you know, boy, I like, I, I have no idea. Obviously whoever's running that account doesn't expect to have a job very long um, (laughs) because it's just absurd stuff that they're tweeting out. Like, I don't even like, it's, it's hard to like kind of wrap your head around, you know, what like is they're obviously trying to be funny, but I don't think you, I don't think it's really working. People are just looking at that thinking like, you're just making this even worse. But I mean, what's your take on this overall situation? Obviously we know that, you know, the Tempe vote, they're not, there isn't going to be, uh, a new arena, a new development happening there in in Tempe, and then there there's talk about you know Salt Lake City. There's talk of Houston. There's talk of Kansas City. I mean, just what's your overall take on this? Obviously, we have no idea. We know that the Arizona Coyotes are going to play at, at Mullet Arena for the 23-24 season, but beyond that, it's like it seems like Ted like spin a wheel, you know, put six cities on a wheel and spin it, and that's my that maybe is where the Arizona Coyotes you know end up. So I, I mean, what's what's your take on this? You know, whole mess. 
I just want to uh, check the calendar. Is it 2011? Right? I mean, 2005? Like, nothing's changed. There's no interest in the team there. It doesn't really matter where they are, whether it's Glendale or Tempe or Phoenix or wherever. There's no interest. They weren't even selling out Mullet Arena. And I'll tell you right now, I was there. And I, I, you know, I tried to embrace it. It had a college atmosphere for sure. There was a lot of young students cheering and having fun, but it was garbage. I mean, that's a terrible place for an NHL team to be playing. I've covered junior games and university games in bigger arenas than that. I think actually, I think actually the 24, 25 season, Ted, they're going to be playing at Billy Mosienko arena. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I guess, uh, you know, I mean, uh, you know, Winnipeg with a second team, I guess that makes a lot of sense. I, I, there's certainly over in Toronto where there's also a lot of core four talk, by the way. Yeah. Uh, you know, the name comes up there of moving, having a second team in Toronto all the time when Phoenix is going. I've even seen a story today where the mayor of Hartford's trying to get a get a call in to, to see about bring the back the whale. If they're not if they're not moving to Quebec City, I don't think they're moving to Hartford either. But uh, <laughs> you know, like like Salt Lake City, Houston, Kansas City. You name all the yeah, you know, like there's there's arena, arenas sitting there ready to go, waiting for a team to come, and I I w- you can't possibly make me understand why this is so important to the well, National Hockey League. I just don't get it, and it's been for years. The amount of money that's drained out mm-hmm. trying to save that, and and as Reason put it in his column, putting a square peg in a round hole, it it just doesn't work. And I don't understand, like, he's been trying to cram it in there for, for 15, 20 years. It's, well, it's unbelievable, and I just hope someday this comes to a resolution. If you're one of the 31 other owners, Ted, I mean, you know, we understand this is obviously Bettman's, you know, Waterloo, it's his pet project, everything along those lines. But if you're one of the other 31 owners, besides the the owners of, the, you know, Gutierrez and then the ownership of the Coyotes, you know, at some point in time, don't you just tell Gary Bettman, look, we've indulged you long enough on this one, you know, that your time your time has expired. You haven't been able to get an arena. You haven't been able to get what I'm going to call stable ownership because they've never had a good owner there, you know. with, with Also, Drew, don't the owners want the relocation money? Well, I mean, they just – they want something more than a, a drain on their bank account, I would say. It's just at some point in time they have to pull the pin and tell Gary that time – you know, the time is up. It, 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 there's no reason to keep indulging them – indulging him with this. Uh, it's, it's That's the bizarre part to me that some of these other owners who are the ones who are actually – you know, the money is coming out of their pockets indirectly because nobody's actually writing a check to them. But that at some point in time they would just say enough is enough and let, let, let's get some let's get this franchise to a to a, a real market or a real city. Yeah, I mean, I the only thing I can think of is that they want to have these other prospective places as possible expansion sites, and I guess maybe there's even more money in like, more money yeah, in there is, and then there is in relocation, right? So you want to keep those options open. That's the only thing I can really think of. And I mean, yeah, I guess Phoenix is a is a big market. There's no doubt about it. There is actually a lot of Canadians there and whatnot. But mm-hmm. having been there a few times, it's also really spread out. And I mean, yeah. it's not it's not a fun place to get onto the freeways and try to drive to you know if you're in one side of the city and you got to drive an hour oh. to the other side of the city. That's why Glendale didn't it's, work. It, it doesn't work, and yeah. um, you know, I I think. There has been some talk how they could possibly move downtown and share the arena with the Suns, which I think they did at one time a long time ago in there, in in this uh, you know many moves uh, franchise situation. But, um, but why there? Like just even if you did do that, why why would you believe that suddenly that city would fall in love with the organization? And they could trade for Austin Matthews, and I still don't think that the city would fall in love with that organization. They could have gotten the Connor Bedard sweepstakes, and I still don't think people would have fallen in love with that situation. That's how bad it is. So, honestly, just move on. Find somewhere <laughs> better. Well, you know, Teddy, if they go to Hartford, though, does that mean the Hurricanes can't wear the Whalers you're in disease anymore? I, how does I, that work? I, I don't know, man. <laughs> if they move to Winnipeg, who has the Jets 1.0 history? Do the, the Jets 2.0 have it? Or do the Arizona Coyotes? Winnipeg Coyotes, anyways. No, but you know what? We we covered a lot of Jets top from your columnist Scotty Billick's uh, 
you know, five things to look at in the off season. So let's hit the fifth and final one that uh, Scott touched on. I think it's important. What are the Jets going to do on defense next year? Because they've got this glut of guys who are coming up through the system. Declan Chisholm is going to be waiver, uh, no longer waiver exam. And that's a big factor because you lost Johnny Kovacevic for nothing last year. Can't afford to do that. That has to management. You lost Leon Gamonke. He went to the DEL. He wasn't waiver exempt this year anyways, but he had a big season in the, with the Moose, so he wouldn't have been available. He would have been claimed, I mean, most likely. What do you do? What are you going to do in the, this team? And that's one of the things Scott was wondering is, what is, yeah. is Kevin Chevalier going to be prepared to make the decisions that he has to make to move on and make some room for some of these young guys? Yeah, he mentioned trading Nate Schmidt, which, I mean, there's a reason why Nate Schmidt has been traded a few times on this same contract that he signed mm-hmm. with Vegas, because he does make a fair bit of money and, and, and it's hard to say whether you get the full value out of it. I mean, he seems like a great locker room guy. The media would miss him very much. No question. Um, and he's a very capable player, but you can't block these guys forever. And I mean, Kovacevic is a perfect example. He's gone and he's, he played well in Montreal. I mean, they seem to like him there. Losing Gavanki is a tough one. I mean, you develop these guys for as long as they have, they're supposed to be coming up and being a part of it. And you've got Chisholm and, and Billy Hanela, who I guess does have another year of waiver exemption. But at some point, you got to play them, don't you? I mean, you just do. You can't, you can't, you, you, draft and develop doesn't work if you don't find a place to put these guys. So, you know, can you move Logan Stanley? Man, we're sure talking about a lot of guys that need to be traded. If you're adding <laughs> Stanley and, uh, and Schmidt to the list that we already started, which already had four names on it, I think. But, you know, that that officially would be blowing it up, wouldn't it be, if you traded six guys? <laughs> but, um, um, yeah, I mean, you've got to do something because that it, it's pretty unfortunate with the way some things went with this team. Losing Kovacevic, losing AC Mont. Mm-hmm. Um, these are things that are, are pretty unfortunate when you've tried to draft and develop and you've you've built a system and you need to integrate those guys into the lineup. And instead, you end up them going and play and playing important roles elsewhere. Ted Wyman from the Winnipeg Sun, sports editor of the Winnipeg Sun. Teddy, always a pleasure to be with you. Appreciate your time and appreciate your insight this morning. Great catching up with you, buddy. All right. Well, I'll listen back to the pod when I'm driving to the lake. There you go. So. Enjoy the drive. Drive safe. Have a great long weekend. We appreciate you sticking through uh, in the city with us. All right. See you guys. Have a Cheers, Ted. Happy long weekend. All right, bye guys. There he goes, Ted Wyman joining us this morning on the program. We'll head to break. We'll let Dave M get a Halls or a lozenge or some maybe a little Ricola, something like that. You know, Buckley. Dave is sounding like Miley Cyrus right now. The smoke. Uh, Dave is, uh, you know, he, he, help he, me. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to break. It's the Illegal Curve Hockey Show. We're live on our social media channels. Keeping Winnipeg laughing for over thirty years. Rumors, Canada's longest-running comedy club, bringing you the biggest laughs from the best comedians on the planet. Jerry Seinfeld, Chris Rock, John Stewart, Dennis Miller, Brad Garrett, the greats, and all the up-and-comers, too. When was the last time you laughed out loud? Make it a great night out with friends or book your office or birthday party, even a fundraising event at Rumors. Get all the details and dates on upcoming shows at RumorsComedyClub.com. Hi, Ez. A strange question for you. But why are you lying on the ground being crushed by a piano? Well, Drew, I definitely tried to carry this baby grand piano down the stairs by myself, and somehow I failed miserably. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. That was a silly question on my part. My apologies. Would you like me to call Rolly's Transfer Moving and Storage to help you move the piano? They are the most experienced piano moving company in Winnipeg, after all. Yes, please call Rollies and hurry. This piano is very, very heavy. Rollies Transfer Moving and Storage offers stress-free residential moving services while taking great care of your personal belongings, including your piano. At Rollies, no job is too big or too small. For more information, visit rollies.com. 
Hi, it's Drew from Illegal Curve here. Selling your home can be stressful, but it wasn't for me. Thanks to my friends at Zapia Group Realty, they made the process so easy. My home sold within 48 hours and with multiple offers. Zapia Group Realty took care of everything with their exquisite customer service and attention to detail. If you want to sell your home for more in less time, get started by talking to Frank and Mauro Zapia of Zapia Group Realty. Online at zapiagroup.com. Hey, Drew. Ezzy, whoa, what a smile. Yeah, I got my crowns done at Linden Market Dental Center, and they whiten my teeth. I see. They're so bright that every time I smile, they go, We have hockey tonight. Do you have a mouth guard to protect those pearly whites? I sure do. Whoa, they even ting through the mouth guard. Linden Market Dental Center covers all your dental needs, from restorative to cosmetic dentistry, and will fit you with a sports guard for that active lifestyle. 877 Waverly. See LindenMarketDental.com. Boston Pizza harnessed Fanalytics to help optimize no-look dipping. Ooh, making adjustments so you can stay focused on the game. The playoffs at Boston Pizza, powered by Fanalytics. Hour number two of the Illegal Curve Hockey Show starts now. We're live this Saturday morning, Victoria Day long weekend. Dave is indicating that he's got a lozenge in his mouth, so I think we should definitely throw it to him immediately for a long synopsis of whatever the hell he wanted to talk about. But instead, that would be mean because I know that how difficult it is to talk and suck on a lollipop at the same time. Speaking of which, Ezzy, do you have any lollipops handy? I don't have any lollipops handy. If I did, I yeah. would probably suck in on it. But before we get back to the Jets talk, because I think, Drew, you do still want to get into the over-under segment that, that you had prepared, because I think we only got to two guys. But, I mean, I, I, this has to be, for me, a Chris Cuthbert appreciation uh, <clears throat> segment. And, and Dave M. touched on it. Like, what noise was that, Dave? <laughs> what is that? Mm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, a bit of a squealing sound coming out of the, the top right of the screen here. But, I mean, Dave put this on Twitter, and there were a lot of people like, like, we're obviously going to talk about the quad OT game. Like, how can we not? I mean, just the way it ended with Matthew Kachuk scoring late in the fourth overtime. But Chris Cuthbert and Craig Simpson, specifically, the reason the connection is, of course, Boston Pizza is a sponsor of ours. And we thank Boston Pizza Winnipeg for their continued sponsorship. But yes. obviously, the voiceover is done by Chris Cuthbert there. You just heard it, right? Mm -hmm. And I agree with Dave. Like, that game itself was amazing. But the fact that Chris Cuthbert, who I think is still, you know, the gold standard of play-by-play -play in, in hockey, obviously, yeah. you know, you guys know that Doc Emmerich was one, one of my favorites. And, you know, we were all big fans of, of Jim Hewson. I think Harner Ryan Singh, i uh, got to give him a shout-out. I think he's become one of the best play-by-play -play guys in the league. There's a lot of good guys. I mean, Dan Robertson here in Winnipeg. But Chris Cuthbert, I mean, he is just – I mean, he's become the new Bob Cole, essentially. Yeah, he uh, he he. His presence makes a game feel bigger, sort of like uh, Al Michaels and John Madden in the NFL back in the day, or Pat Summerall yeah. and John Madden. Uh, you know, uh, may they both rest in peace. Um, Al Michaels still going strong, of course, but you know, his presence makes a game feel important, and that's what you saw. Certainly, uh, I guess that would have been Thursday night with the uh, overtime epic, and we're gonna have George Richards uh, from Florida Hockey Now. Uh, who covers the Panthers, good friend of the program. He's going to join us at the bottom of the hour to talk about that series and talk about... Those pesky uh, cats, Drew. Well, they certainly are pesky. Talk about Paul Maurice and his performance behind the bench because I know lots of people in Winnipeg uh, keeping a close eye on that series, and it certainly got off to an epic start. But it's the kind of game, that game, you know, that, that, that overtime epic that, you know, taking a day off like they did doesn't heal everything like that. That requires... I mean, that's going to... To just be on you. I expect tonight's game between the Panthers and to the and the Hurricanes to be quite sloppy, to really not be that well played, to be honest, just because of the physical toll that the players took in that game, especially Brandon Montour, who played did he I, I, you know about an hour of ice time. Yeah. It was, know, it was at least 40 minutes. It was probably closer to 50 minutes. I think it was closer to like 57 is where he ended at. I think I saw somewhere around there. I'm not exactly sure of the number, but just a, 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 a an, an epic all around. And then Matthew Kachuk, where it just seemed like, I think everybody sort of expect we were off to overtime num number five. And then, you know, uh, he just sort of sneaks the puck and, and, and just goes. Pointing to the exit here, Drew. Pointing to the exit. That's right. He just goes. He just skates right off. Shades of Blake Wheeler with his uh, walk-off shootout winner against the Flames back in the day. Slightly more uh, impact, slightly more importance on this one, though, Dave. I know that you were up for it. 
Yeah, and I was anticipating that it was going to be a five overtime. I thought for sure. I was like, okay, no chance. This is going five. And uh, it was it was another awesome. lozenge, by the way, Dave. All right, I'm trying. I'm doing my best here, Ezzy. Not I don't play talk. hurt, Dave. It's his flu uh, game. Yeah, yeah, like no, it's no flu. I just I've done a lot of talking, guys. Tuesday night, you guys weren't there. I was, I was, I was doing it all for IC, and then Thursday, two hours of talking on the end of season Moose Roundtable. Great job it's, on it's, that, by the way. Thank you. It's but it's destroyed my voice, uh, you know. And I like to talk otherwise. I was out last night, yesterday. We we're celebrating my our friend. Richard Tapper, his life, celebrating his memory. So uh, with the guys, so a lot of uh, shooting the shit with the boys. Uh, you know, my boys trying to carry, and obviously I've done some damage, as as he has pointed off. So um, <laughs> active anyways, in the chat GPT, Drew. Any event, let's get anyways, back to oh, no, I was just gonna say, anyway, it was a phenomenal, it was a phenomenal hockey game, and Chris Cuthbert did just a f- fantastic job. He really was, he was enjoyable to listen to, and he and he heightens it, and that's what you want a color guy to do. You want him to I play by place, right? Guy. You yeah. want him you want him to be able to enhance what you're watching. Sometimes guys can ruin your experience. All he did was enhance it. And they certainly did. He he certainly did. And we'll get back to the Jets momentarily before I do so. I want to remind people coming up in less than a month, June 19th, the Rady JCC 49th annual Ken Cronson Sports Dinner, a legal curve, a proud sponsor, a proud supporter of the sports dinner. Uh, it's going to be taking place at RBC Convention Center, Winnipeg. Tickets available, RadyJCC.com. Not one, not two, but three legendary members of the Chicago Black. Blackhawks will be on hand uh, at that dinner. Chris Chelios, Ed Belfort, Jeremy Roenick. So hear from those three Blackhawks. It's going to be a roundtable discussion with them. You know that they're going to tell some great stories about a very legendary era of the NHL and of the Blackhawks. You can probably hear Jeremy Roenick will probably have some thoughts about the Coyotes situation as well because he played for them as well. So tickets available, RadyJCC.com. Big thanks to the Rady JCC for their support of Illegal Curve and in kind, Illegal Curve support of the Rady JCC Sport Center. We're looking forward to that coming up next month super pumped i just want to say one thing it's pretty cool i mean first off you've got two hall of famers out of those three and i think there's a strong argument jeremy ronick has got 500 career goals i realize that ronick is a bit of a polarizing guy when you talk about the hall of fame but the point is that two of those guys chelios and belfort are hall of famers and you have a guy that might end up being in the hall of fame one day a guy that's got 500 career goals obviously jr is a great personality so i agree we're super pumped up to be going to the Rady Dinner on June 19th. I just want to get this in. I've been to three Rady Dinners, the first one being back in uh, 2000 when I was the first overall pick in the Maccabi B Hockey League, and we won the championship. Shout out to uh, Aubrey Margolis, uh, Evan Margolis, Garth Nemi, uh, proud champions uh, for Denali. We saw Ruben Hurricane Carter, and then the other, and obviously I didn't name my son after Ruben Hurricane Carter. I ma- named him after the sandwich, of course. Yes, but then the true. other two guys that I saw uh, were courtesy of Rumors Restaurant and Comedy Club and courtesy of the very generous Mandel family. We saw Magic Johnson and, of course, another Hall of Famer, Mark Messier. There you go. Thank you, Mr. Ginsburg, for that interlude. Uh, before we get on to the other couple of names in the over-under, let me ask you guys this. Uh, you know, if Pierre-Luc Dubois gets traded to the Montreal Canadiens, I mean, that, and that's certainly been uh, the connection and the ties and what everyone is sort of expecting, does that f- that fifth overall pick this year for the Habs, is that a centerpiece of that trade? Does that have to be a key part of that trade from the Winnipeg Jets' perspective? In if, if that if Pierre-Luc Dubois is going to Montreal, do the Jets need to get that fifth overall pick back in return? As a you go, Dave doesn't have the voice. Well, I think the the late first round pick. I think it's here, Dave. Get yourself off of unmute there, because let's let's give Dave like Dave sucking on a fisherman's friend. He's losing his voice here. I mean, Dave was surrounded. I don't know if you know this, Drew, but he it was like a mob. There was like hundreds of people surrounding him at Trans Canada Brewing, and he was signing a lot of autographs and everything like that. And then obviously, you know, he was doing the end of season moose show. Um, a few days ago, right? So we got to give Dave a little bit of, cut, cut him some slack. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think the fifth overall pick, I, look, at, I, I think, look, look, you could get a guy like Zach Benson, fifth overall, you could get a guy like Leo Carlson, fifth overall, right? Like, I don't know if the Montreal Canadiens are necessarily uh, going to part with that fifth overall pick, Dave, I would assume it, w- it would be the late first rounder. I think it's 29th overall. That oh. would probably be part of a deal. It depends where Florida ends up. So is that, you right. know, if, yeah. if it's the late first rounder, 
which is obviously is you know that has a hell of a lot less value than the fifth overall pick. I don't need to tell anybody. Yeah, that. but it's going to be twenty eighth, twenty ninth, thirtieth, thirty first. But, it's not, that, but yeah. it's not. It's not. A, it's not a huge asset. So obviously, it's almost like you know you get a. Well, look a, at the Jets got Brad Lambert drew at at thirtieth overall. Look the the right. Edmonton Oilers took Reed Schaefer and then traded him to Nashville at thirty second overall. So you can get a and this is a deep draft. So. I wouldn't downplay the the 29th or 30th overall pick. But if you're getting a late first rounder, then you obviously have to also be getting, I'd say, a, a an impactful roster player. Whereas if you're getting the top five pick, I think maybe you get a less impactful roster player. I think it's one yes. or the other. You're 100% so which, right on that. So, yeah. You know, I guess from the Jets perspective, which one do you think has more value to them or more appeal to them? The, the high first rounder and a less impactful roster pl- uh, player or the low first rounder and a guy who can step right into your lineup, i.e. a Kirby Doc, and maybe fill a, a void that Pierre-Luc Dubois is, is leaving, his absence is leaving. Yeah, but Drew, I think it's also a function of what Montreal is willing to give up. And I don't think they're willing to give up the fifth round pick, the fifth overall pick. I think it's just, as, as he said, it's too deep a draft. And there's too much excitement around it right now. So, you know, and, and look... There's, there's a lot of arrogance coming out of Montreal because you're some of the proposals and people are like, well, no chance, no chance. You're giving, we're, you're getting him for free in a year. The reality is Pierre-Luc Dubois, as much as he wants to play, he could sign for big money somewhere. Montreal's not going to be a good team next year. They're probably not going to be a good team in two, for two more years, three more years. They've got a young group. If I'm Pierre-Luc Dubois, do I want to be part of that for the next two, three, four years? Or am I more likely to sign somewhere, to sign a three-year deal, a four-year deal, five-year deal, for good money, come to Montreal when they're looking like they could be a champion. Because, look, everybody, Pierre-Luc Dubois talked about it. Matty Perot took less money to go sign and be a Montreal Canadian so he could put on that Canadian's jersey than he would have. He would have made more money in Winnipeg, right? And the Jets would have used them. The problem is, as much as everybody wants to play for Montreal, as much as everyone wants to put on that jersey, personally, and again, I can't speak from experience, but I think personally... I don't really think he can really it. speak at all right now, to be honest with you. <laughs> Zinger. But I think that, that I don't think, Ezzy, I can't use my voice extraneously. What are you doing here? The point I'm trying to make is nobody wants to go there when there's a challenge. I don't think. I mean, like you could say, oh, everybody embraces that. There's a shit ton of pressure. You know, people say, oh, playing in Winnipeg is hard. Uh, Montreal <laughs> no, is not. like, Montreal is next level. Yeah. Montreal is to the next Montreal level. Montreal and Toronto, Dave, I think are... Uh, well, they're head and shoulders above all other teams just because yes. of the histories of those franchises, right? Right, of course. So what I'm saying is if you're Pierre-Luc Dubois and you go there and you get traded for pieces that folks in, in Montreal see are a big part of the future, and Montreal's got a lot of center depth right now with the way they've constructed their team. So I just say that, like, first of all, there's the arrogance. There's the the belief that you're getting the player. So you could trade a hill of beans. We've been using beans a lot on today's show, but... You could trade whatever you want and get rid of and get Pierre Luc Dubois for free, basically. So if I'm Kevin Sheffield-Dayoff, it's not like a Jacob Trouba only wants to sign with the New York Rangers. Pierre Luc Dubois has expressed interest, sure, whatever, but you just can't have blinders on and say Montreal is our only option. Yeah, I would agree. And just you know, again, I'm not saying Drew. It's a good question. I just don't see personally. This is just my own opinion. I don't. I don't like. We just don't see a lot of especially top five first round picks traded, like just go back year after year. You just don't mm-hmm. see it a lot. So that's all I'm saying. I, I'm not saying that I'm, I'm saying that more in terms of just general um, the, the general NHL draft discussion. I'm not talking right. about that necessarily in the context of, you know, the Habs acquiring Pierre-Luc Dubois and what they might give up. I just think, especially because it's such a deep draft. And as Dave mentioned, this Habs team, I think two or three years from now, they're going to be a competitive team. You look at Lane Hudson, and we've had Craig Button on the show, I mean, how many times, and we had him on last year. He was saying that Lane Hudson would have easily been a top five pick if he wasn't five foot nine, right? They got him 62nd overall. And I realized that, you know, and if, and if you want to see what Lane Hudson has been doing, um, you know, just YouTube Lane Hudson, you know, highlight goals. I mean, he's an incredible defenseman, kind of along that same vein of like a Tory Krug or, or going back to my Devils days, uh, Brian Rafalski, obviously watching the Devils, not playing for the Devils, right? But uh, yeah, so I mean, you can get a really good player. Yeah, you can get a really good player, you know, late in the first round or in the second round or even the later round. So uh, when you're talking about fifth overall, I mean, that's, uh, if if you want to use an analogy with cards, I mean, that's that's an ace. A fifth overall pick is an ace. And I just don't think that the the Canadians will move that pick, Drew. But 
I mean, I think the, the big uncertainty along with, you know, when the Jets would potentially move Dubois prior to the draft, or are they going to wait until the summer or early in the season, whatever, I mean, is a, another team kind of being in the picture here? Because the it's it's a rare situation, like Dave said. I mean, it wasn't a foregone conclusion. It wasn't like Jacob Truba told the Jets, I'm only going to the New York Rangers, right? Like there were, there were other teams in play. We don't know exactly, you know, which other teams were close, but I think that's what's making this a little bit more complicated for Chevy is that, you know, through his agent and through the media, he's made it clear that he wants to go back to Montreal. Well, yeah, I saw Jay Miller and a bunch of other IC regulars talking about Kirby Doc. Nick Suzuki's the captain. Nick Suzuki's not being traded. He's untouchable. He uh, like, there's certain players that are untouchable. Uri Slikovsky, he's he's not coming to Winnipeg. Lane Hudson, I don't think, uh, you know, the Habs want to train, <laughs> trade Lane Hudson. He's one of their top D prospects, right? So I think you're looking at Kirby Doc. And, you know, I, I don't think you're going to do, obviously, Pierre-Luc Dubois for Kirby Doc straight up, Dave. But, you know, we've been following him since the Saskatoon days. Um, you know, Kirby Doc's a good player coming off a career year. I think he had 20 goals, 38 points, something like that, or 15 goals and 38 points. I forget exactly what it was. Um, but he's a young player, 22, 23 years old. But you're going to have to throw in something else with Kirby Doc. It's not going to just be Dubois for Doc. But I think it's if it's Montreal, it's you're limited in what you can acquire, right? Like, there's only so many guys, like... Is a guy like Josh Anderson? Does he interest the Jets? I have no idea. But there's only, let, let's say, a handful of players that you're starting off with in terms of trades, right, for, for Pierre-Luc Dubois. So I think the, the big unknown is, you know, could Dubois be moved to another team? Because if he's going to be moved to another team, obviously, you know, there's a there's a, a whole world of possibilities that opens up in terms of prospects and, and different centers that you could acquire. Well, from the Jets' perspective, I mean, they're not under any obligation to trade him to Montreal. Maybe Montreal pays a premium uh, to to ensure that they get him. But from the Jets' perspective, they can put him up for on the block for whomever wants him. And, you know, if there's, maybe there's a team out there who thinks that Pierre-Luc Dubois is the player who, you know, puts them over, you know, makes them, you know, just solidifies their core a little bit more for a run to the Stanley Cup final. But, uh, you know, obviously that's something that uh, time will tell on uh, as we get closer to the NHL draft. Uh, let me ask this question, going back to our over-under uh, conversation that we were having earlier in the show that we started the show off with, Connor Hellebuck, he's sort of, you know, almost the the linchpin to everything here because he's, we know, a year away from unrestricted free agency. We know he has no interest in being anywhere other than on a Stanley Cup contending team. What is the, I'm going to set the over-under at 65% that the Jets trade him. Do you think that it's a 60, do you think that the odds are better than 65% or less than 65%? Less. less. Go ahead. Yeah. I, like, I, and we talked about it with Teddy Wyman, right, Drew? Like, and again, this is just my own personal opinion. I'm, I'm definitely not an insider. In fact, I'm a Jets outsider. They don't let me in Canada Life Center or Hockey for All Center. No. So I'm an outsider. I'm usually outside trying to get into the buildings, right? But I, I just don't know, especially, you know, Hellebuck might win the Vesna Trophy. I know, Drew, you know, we went back and forth last week. Linus Allmark, there's a good chance he wins it. But at the very least, Hellebuck is a Vesna finalist. He's at the peak of his game. And he's going to be a really good goaltender for six, seven, eight more years, maybe even longer, right? He's in the prime of his career. I just don't know how you trade Hellebuck if you're going for it next year. Again, I realize that a lot of people, you know, a lot of Jets fans say, well, you know, you're going to give him a lot of money. You're going to tie up a lot of money in a goaltender. Well, I don't think this is a Sergei Bobrovsky situation. And even if you want to compare Hellebuck to Bobrovsky, Bobrovsky's doing pretty well in the playoffs, right? The Panthers are in the Eastern Conference Finals. So, again, I don't think you can necessarily, Dave, compare, you know, apples and apples. You, know, you can't compare, like, Carey Price is the guy that I've used as the comparable in terms of contract. I imagine Hellebuck's agent is going to want the Carey Price type of contract, and he deserves it. When you've been nominated for a Vesna three of the last five years, including winning a Vesna, you've established yourself as a top five, I would say top two goalie in the league. Um, so I, I think, you know, he can ask for $9 million a year. He can ask for maybe even $10 million a year. And I, I would sign that. I would have no problem because where would the Jets have been last year without Hellebuck? I don't think they make the playoffs without Hellebuck. So if you're going for it next year, I well, think you absolutely bring Hellebuck back and you sign him to a long-term deal. And I realize you could get a lot in return. And I realize you could point to a team like the Carolina Hurricanes who don't spend a lot of money on their goaltender, but the Jets aren't the Carolina Hurricanes. Again, you can't compare apples and apples, the Jets and the Hurricanes. The Jets don't have the ability, you know, to acquire UFAs like the Hurricanes do. You know, living in Carolina to a lot of NHL players is more attractive 
than living in Winnipeg. Let's be honest. Like I'm a proud Winnipegger. Um, but you know, a lot of NHL guys like Winnipeg is at the bottom of their list in terms of where they want to go. Right. And again, I'm not, you know, being negative. That's just the reality. I think most people agree with that. And you can just look at it year over year. The Jets don't acquire top UFAs. That's not to say that they can't retain their current players. They've done that with, you know, guys like Hellebuck and, and Shifley, Morrissey, Connor, Ehlers. The, the, they love living here and they've done that. So, no, I, I, I think it's less than 65%. I don't think the Jets will trade Hellebuck. And, and, and I think, you know, what type of message does that send to the, the rest of the team when you trade your MVP? Dave, go ahead. No, I, the only thing I would add is that you have to also consider who's taking his place. I mean, are you handing the net to... Not obviously David Riddick, but are you handing that to Arvid Holm? The goalie, the, the goalie no. is not in the in the organization currently. That's right. That's what I mean. So, yeah. so what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to get a goaltender. So you're trading a goaltender to get a goaltender, mm-hmm. but that's not. And you're never going to get a goaltender as good back. Like unless well, they're trading for Linus Allmark or UC Soros or Andre Vasilevsky, Dave, you're not getting the equivalent of Connor Hellebuck back. And I'd have to look at the UFAs right now in terms of goalies and to see who you know, the Jets could overpay for a year or two, hoping that someone within the framework of the organization is going to take that next step. There's a lot of excitement because Dominic DiVincentis. Oh, I know. Why? Well, well, that's why I, when I, people say like f- f- the Devils, for example. Yes, I think the Devils would love to have Connor Hellebuck. You're not trading Connor Hellebuck for Vitek Vanacek. You're, and, and I don't think the Devils are interested in trading Akira Schmid at 22 years old with all of the cost certainty with him, right, Dave? Yeah. So, like, exactly. you know, I, I I just don't see Hellebuck being traded to the Devils for Jesper Brad and a first round pick. Like, that just doesn't make any sense to me. Well, you have to again, be getting a good goaltender back, right? And again, it defeats the purpose, right? If your if your need is elsewhere, you know, your goaltender is solid, one of the top goalies in the NHL, and you're trading away a goaltender to have to acquire another goaltender because the UFA market's terrible. The ones who are in the system, Oscar Salmanen, Arvid Holm with the Moose. Dominic DiVincentis, who's a obviously one OHL goalie of the year, but you got to take that with a grain of salt. He's years away from being years away. So the reality for me is you have to be realistic. Now, look, does, Do- does Connor Hellebeck want to be here without the chance to compete for something? Obviously, he doesn't. He said as much. So I think what all of these conversations that we are having prove is that the vision that for this franchise, which I, again, didn't seem that it was clearly understood by the players when they had their end of season media availabilities needs to be clear to them from this GM, from the, through the, throughout the organization. What Mm -hmm. is the vision of this team? They don't have, they don't have an obligation to tell us. No, they, you think that they would want to because through us, it gets to the fans and from the fans, you get the season tickets sold. Or just talk to fans directly. I mean, well, whatever, whatever, but I'm just, just, we're just the conduit, right, Dave? Yeah, exactly. But what I'm saying is that the the reality for this organization, I think, in total, is that you need to have a vision and the players need to be able to, because again, from what I heard in those end of season media availabilities, there was a lot of uncertainty. I have to talk to him. I have to. Well, it should be clear. This is what our vision is. This is where we're going. You're going to be a part of it. And you're going to be a part of it if you sign this deal. If you don't sign this deal, you're not going to be a part of it. We're going to move you. We're going to move on from you. And I think that has to be the reality for this Jets club. So do I think that they can make tweaks? Do I think they need to blow the whole thing up? No, but I definitely think that they can't. You can't run it back. You had your chance to run it back. You did. It didn't work. So now it's time to do something different. Connor Hellbuck for William Nylander. Call it him. Oh, uh, <laughs> one more uh, on the over-under uh, game that we've been playing this morning. Over or under 40% that the Winnipeg Jets buy out Blake Wheeler. Wow, that's a lot of money, right? What did, well, I mean, in, in the cap. It's, it's two point eight seven five. It's less than you're going to have to retain if you trade him. Well, say that again, Dave. Right? He said it's less than you're going to have to retain if you trade him. It's less than you're going to have to retain if you trade right. him. And who knows? Uh, I mean, if you trade, I mean, it's sort of you can look at it in, in, in you know all together, sort of. If you trade him, are you really getting anything back, or are you just getting? Uh, is it a salary dump? Probably sure. mostly a salary dump that you're going to retain 50%, let's say, and that's so $4 million for one year. So would you rather have $4 million of Blake Wheeler on your books for one year 
or 2.875 million of a bought out Blake Wheeler for two years. Yeah, there's a strong argument for the latter, right, Drew? And 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 it's an interesting one, right? Like I think I personally don't think that the Jets are going to buy him out. I'm not. I wouldn't be shocked if they do buy him out. I, I I agree with Teddy Wyman, who we had on about half an hour ago. Like I do think you have to move on from Blake Wheeler. I mean, he's been the face of the franchise, the captain for you know six or seven years, obviously not including last year. Um, but I think it's time to to move on. I mean, his as, as we've talked about, like most likely. You know, Blake Wheeler's name will be up in the rafters. He's one of the best best Jets 2.0 of all time. But I think you got to move on, not just because of his salary, but because you have younger players, I think, that that can fill those types of roles, right? Like, I think Dave would agree. Cole Perfetti is most likely going to be your second-line winger next year. Or at the very least, you know, he, he's going to be in your top nine on the wing. And then we, we could have that discussion about, you know, whether Perfetti can center a line at the NHL level. He's obviously got to stay healthy, right? He's had lots of injury issues, as Dave M has documented uh, on this show and IllegalCurve.com. Had to get the website plug in at least once, Dave, today. I'll probably get it in again. But I, I do think that, you know, the Jets are going to move on from Wheeler, Drew. Uh, but I don't think it's going to be a buyout. I do think they're going to try to get something for him. I don't think his trade value is really high. But he's still, hey, he still had, what, 55 points last year? So I think there is some value. I, I do think they'll try to get maybe a prospect or a, a draft pick for him. Um, but again, I wouldn't be surprised if they buy him out. So, Dave, if the Jets retain 50% of Wheeler, can they yeah. get an asset back in exchange? Or does it have to just be a salary dump? Can they get something back that could help them moving forward? Well, I mean, here's the issue. You've added another year. You tried this. You went down this road last year. You explored the market. Blake Wheeler explored the market. Mm -hmm. There weren't any takers. And that was Blake Wheeler with one less year of mileage on the old vehicle, boys. Mm -hmm. So. You've added but, only, but only one year left on the contract. True, true. It's a good point, is. But I mean, look, the Jets organization doesn't have a. Um, I appreciate all the suggestions, by the way. I will get some honey. My Baba always said a little bit of honey and in some water will help. Uh, yeah, so salt water. Gonna, salt water usually does the trick for me. Well, we'll do. We'll see what we can do. But uh, of course, the show must go on, folks. So I'm going to soldier through and get through it. And but I appreciate that, Trish. Thank you for the suggestion. Look, the Jets organization doesn't have a history of buyouts. Mark Stewart is the only one in the history mm -hmm. of the Jets 2.0 uh, in 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 as an example of a Steve Mason was traded. He wasn't bought out, right? Correct. He was traded to Montreal right. with yeah. uh, jo Remember Joel had... Armia. Right. Yeah, Joel. Joel, Joel. That was the other guy, right. Dave, that I think we thought might be bought out, you know, whatever that was, six years ago, seven years yeah. ago. Yeah, and they ended up trading him. And then, you know, of course, they got back. Um, oh, what did they get back? Uh uh, wasn't oh, it, what's his he, name? Um, he wasn't a real he, prospect. No, I know he didn't play. He retired. Um, I know who you're talking about, but I can't, I can't remember his name. Doesn't matter. Simon Bork. Yes, yes, there we go. There you go. Good job, Eddie. Um, that was Google, by the way. That wasn't know, yeah, that wasn't my memory. I know, I know. Yeah, yeah. Anywho, the point is. Anywho, the point is that I'm just saying that the 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 organization doesn't have a history of doing it, and you have to, as he's right. Again, it becomes a function of. Do you have his replacement in the wings? Do you have someone who's going to take that spot? And 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 or or if you buy him out at two point seven five million, can you use the additional five something to find yourself a player? You know, like someone who's younger, someone who's going to fill that role. Does Nino need a rider become that player in the last year of his deal? Um, you know, he seems to be doing quite well in the World Championships. I believe up against Canada this year, but he's doing real well with Switzerland. I mean that 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 to me is always the question. You can you can look at these things, but it's a twofold issue. One, can you get a player who's going to be able to replace the minutes? And we we all agree, Blake Wheeler, like him or not, he still always gives you what he can always give you, and and he leaves it all out there on the ice. We will find out more regarding the ongoing Winnipeg Jets offseason as the days and the weeks go by. When we come back, George Richards from Florida Hockey Now joins us to talk about the Panthers and the Hurricanes and former Jets head coach Paul Maurice. Stay with us. It's the Saturday morning edition of the Illegal Curve Hockey Show. Bottom of hour number two. Welcome back to the Illegal Curve Hockey Show. Drew Mandel, Dave Manuk, Ezra Ginsburg with you on this Saturday morning. And we're pleased to welcome to the program from Florida hockey now to talk about the florida panthers talk about the carolina hurricanes to talk about the epic game one of the eastern conference final george richards joins us on the show george good morning thanks very much for joining us how are things 
Oh, all is well. Good morning to you. What's going on? Well, we're just talking about... Long time no see, George. We haven't seen you in a long time. It's been way too long. It's been a long time. Good to see you guys. Likewise. Just obviously the epic game one between the Panthers and the Carolina Hurricanes, uh, a game that people certainly won't forget anytime soon. I'm sure that same goes with hockey fans in South Florida. Just, I I, I guess I'd start with the aftermath of that game one. I mean, you know, to play that many minutes of hockey, we saw Brandon Montour's numbers of just incredible ice time and the amount of marathons he skated on the ice. Just, you know, beyond the impact of the one win in the in the win column, how significant do you think the impact of that uh, overtime epic will have on the remainder of the series? Well, I think with all the energy that was, that was you know, exuded, um, and to not come away with a win, I think is it, just such a, you know, such a hit, you know, to Carolina. And it would have been to Florida too. You go through all the trials and tribulations of a four overtime game. I mean, you basically played, you played two games in a, in a period um, and you get nothing to show for it. I mean, that, that, that hurts. Um, I think, you know, Carolina with Rod Brindamore, he's given his team the last, you know, he gave him his team off yesterday. They didn't, they're not, they didn't take a morning skate today. Um, so they know that they need to get their rest and get back at it. They need to win game two because right now Florida's got home ice advantage. Um, not that that's mattered in the playoffs. The Panthers have been absolutely terrific on the road. They're one loss away from Sunrise game one against Boston. Since then, they've won seven in a row away from home. So um, home ice advantage doesn't it doesn't seem to phase them a whole lot. So George, there's so many players that we can ask you about. I, I, I'm going to leave Sergei Bobrovsky for, for Dave or Drew because Bobrovsky, like, as you know, is one of the best stories in terms of, you know, his struggles after he signed the big contract. And, you know, I think you'd agree right now he's probably the favorite uh, for the Conn Smythe. Or if he isn't the favorite, he's one of the favorites for the Conn Smythe trophy. I might be getting a little bit ahead of myself, George, here, but, you know, I apologize, but he's been that good. But I wanted to ask you about Carter, <laughs> Carter Verhage, right? Like Verhage, Matthew Kachuk is leading them, the Panthers, in points. Carter Verhage is right behind him. I think he's got uh, 13 or 14 points. Um, you know, obviously we know that the Panthers basically stole him away, uh, you know, for considering what they gave up. But Verhage is a guy that I thought he was one of the best Panthers forwards uh, in game one versus Carolina. He obviously had uh, a couple of points, including a goal. I mean, just how, how impressed have you been with Carter Verhage in the playoffs? Maybe not, maybe not that surprising considering that, you know, he's been so good for the, the Panthers over the last few seasons. Well, the Panthers wouldn't have gotten out of the first round last year if it wasn't for Carter Verhage. Uh, he had two overtime game winners against the Washington Capitals, got the game six clincher, um, and then the Panthers move on and get swept by Tampa Bay, his former team. Um, that whole for, for top line for Florida was dominant on uh, in game one. You had Sasha Barkov. You had Carter Verhage and Anthony DeClaire, who set up both of those goals, uh, Carter Verhage's goal and Sasha Barkov's goal to give the Panthers a 2-1 lead there in the second period. Um, the line was out shoot. I think they were out shooting their opponent 10 to 2 at one point. Um, and we forget, you know, Matt Matthew Kachuk got the game winner in overtime. His line didn't have a single shot on goal going into overtime. So um, Florida's top line was driving play. Their third line was playing very well as well. Um, so, but, but well, you, you asked about Carter Verhage. Very impressed with him. He's been absolutely terrific. A 40-goal score this year. Um, just an absolute great move by Bill Zito and the staff. He was one of Florida's first free agent signings after Bill Zito took over. Tampa Bay didn't want to give him a qualifying offer because he had uh, uh, what he called arbitration rights. They thought he, they were going to get burned and they didn't have the cap space to deal with it. So Florida gets a gift. You know, George, we got to ask about all the winning these teams are doing in South Florida, the Miami heat. And you, like you said, talking about teams that don't care if they win on the road, they go into Boston, they're up to nothing in their conference finals. And of course, Florida up one, nothing. So what's the fan base like in South Florida for both the hockey teams and the basketball teams? I know the, the both teams seem to be promoting each other, at least on social media. Yeah, that's rare for the Heat and the Panthers <laughs> to kind of come together because they compete against each other, right? Unlike other, you know, NHL and NBA markets, the Panthers and Heat play in two different buildings. So they go head to head. They're trying to get this, you know, different people to, you know, 
they try to get money out of everybody, the same people, basically. But um, it's been good. I mean, we have a lot of Boston fans living here in South Florida, and they're not too happy because uh, the, <laughs> the Panthers and Heat are five and zero in their last five games at Boston Garden. So, um, you know, they're not too pleased. But people are up. Yeah, it, it, it's an exciting time right now. There's no doubt about it. They're playing on alternating days. So you get to watch the Heat one night, the Panthers the other night. You've got the Miami Heat players saying they stayed up at their hotel room till two in the morning watching the Panthers. That never happens. Um, and then you got the Panthers watching the Heat game. So um, everybody's having a real good time with it. Um, you know, you see this in other cities. You see, you know, Pittsburgh, you know, Penguin players wearing a Pirates hat or something. But we never see that synergy here in South Florida with the Miami teams and. Uh, now they're all starting to come together for the cause, and you know, you know, it, it's it's good to see actually. With George Richards is our guest on the Illegal Curve Hockey Show. George is the editor in chief of Florida Hockey Now. Uh, George, we have to ask about Paul Maurice because it wasn't that long ago that fans here in Winnipeg remember when he, you know, quote unquote, lost his smile and he had to resign as the head coach of the Winnipeg Jets, and then I think it raised a lot of eyebrows when the Panthers elected to not bring back Andrew Brunette and instead went and hired Paul Maurice as head coach. And it didn't look like it was necessarily a great decision during the regular season, but he got them into the playoffs. And two uh, two series wins later, he has them up one nothing in the Eastern Conference Final. From your perspective, how has Maurice maybe evolved as the, a coach of the Panthers throughout this season? How has he, as he's become more familiar with the team and more familiar with the players, how has he maybe uh, adapted his style to fit the team? Well, I think he's just having fun with it and letting them do, you know, he's putting in for, you know, putting in his game plan, doing the X and O's and all that stuff, and then letting them run it. He's got a very veteran team, um, a, a team that, that, kind of knows what they're doing at this point and that's what he says he says you know he just lets the bench take over and I don't know anything that happened in Winnipeg I don't talk to Paul about what happened in Winnipeg I just you know know what I read um you know coming out of out of there last year and and some of the locker room talk and all that stuff and I think he just it's so it's a breath of fresh air down here literally and figuratively because this is not a a place where you have any of that locker room tension. It, it, these guys go to each other's houses in Fort Lauderdale and swim and boat and jet ski, and they do all kinds of stuff off the ice. And I think you see that closeness on the ice. Um, and I, I think that, that, that Paul got excited when he started talking to, 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 to Bill Zito about the opportunity to coach the Panthers and Bill Zito had a vision of what he wanted the Panthers to look like. And what he wanted them to look like was Tampa Bay in last year's second round playoff series. And that's what Paul Maurice has brought to the Panthers. This Panther team looks a lot like that Tampa Bay team last year. They got the goaltending. They played, the, they've got the same six defensemen, and they just keep going, coming at you, and, and they can score. And this is a team that plays terrific defensive hockey and can score on you at any minute. Um, that's Tampa Bay, and that's what the Florida Panthers are right now. You know, George, you mentioned the defenseman, and it, it ties into my next question. And I am going to leave Sergei Bobrovsky to Dave. I could ask you a Bobrovsky-related question, but I want to ask you, I mean, there's a lot of great storylines in the, in the series, as you know, and to me, one of the best storylines is the Stahl brothers. And obviously the Panthers have two yeah. of those Stahl brothers in Eric Stahl, who's who's played on that fourth line. And then you've got Mark Stahl as well. Stahl, of course, there's that uh, kind of a second storyline with him, you know, leading the Hurricanes to the Stanley Cup back in, in 2006. So you can touch on that maybe as well. But just, I mean, the Stahl brothers obviously aren't putting up a lot of points on the board. But I, I mean, it just seems to me like those guys are having a big influence on the rest of the team. Because obviously the Stahl brothers... Or I'm talking about Eric and Mark here, obviously, on the Panthers. Sure. I mean, obviously, they're towards the end of their NHL careers, but it just seems like, and when you talk about Mark Stahl as well, I just checked his ice time. I knew it was up there, but 44 minutes and 44 seconds for, right. for a guy who's, let's be honest, he's not a young hockey player. No. I just think, you know, Mark Stahl and Eric Stahl have, I mean, you can just see the, the type of uh, veteran leadership and impact they're having, especially on some of the younger Panthers players. Yeah, listen, I, I, the Panthers did not expect Mark Stahl to play 82 games in the regular season for, for $750,000. Don't remember when the Panthers signed him as a free agent, it was obviously a package deal with Eric because of, of Paul Maurice's uh, ties with Eric Stolp from their Carolina days. But 
the Panthers still had Mackenzie Weger. It looked like that that, that Mark Stahl was going to be, you know, a seventh defenseman. Then they trade Mackenzie Weger. They're up against the cap. He's one of their top six and has been all year. So credit to him. He has shown his age. The, the, the defense for the Panthers has been a, has been their weakness all year, although it's been okay. But when you look at everything else, it's, it's been their weakness. They just didn't have the money to spend on it. Um, that'll change next year. But it's working. It's been don't break. They've been, you know, they're good with their sticks. They're good in front of Sergei Bobrovsky or whoever is in goal. Um, and Mark Stahl's been a part of that. Now, there are some moments where you just go, ugh, you know, you see something and you're like, oh, Mark Stahl. And, but then he comes back and he makes a play. Um, he's been playing with Brandon Montour. You know, they've been playing great together. So, you know, give the, give give him his due. He hasn't missed a game all year. As for Eric, listen, this guy was out of the NHL last year. He was captain of Team Canada at the uh, non-NHL Olympics. Um, Florida gives him a chance. They couldn't sign him out of training camp because they didn't have they didn't have any money under the cap. Aaron Eckblad goes on LTIR. That gives the Panthers a chance to sign him to a contract. Then they go through the gymnastics of the salary cap the rest of the year. But um, he's been a nice, real nice addition. And in December, when this team was really struggling, Eric Stahl was probably one of their better players. Um, and you can see glimpses of the Eric Stahl that he used to be. Now he's a defensive fourth line guy shutting people down. But there are times he comes through the zone and you're like, that's the guy from Carolina. And uh, in Paul Maurice, you could see you could you could see his smile all the way up in the press box whenever that happens. Well, George, we got to ask you about Officer Bobrovsky because as he teased it up a couple of times already, but he he's not. It's it's a good point because he's eight two and zero. Oh, his uh, his goals against is down to two point four three. Save percentage nine twenty seven. I mean, he's having a fantastic playoffs. What is it? Is it the way the team's playing in front of him, or have you seen a resurgence in Bobrovsky? Maybe having some time off. That's allowed him to get back to like an elite level. I think it's both. I, I think that the team's playing terrific in front of him. Um, and he's making absolutely terrific saves. Um, he's only had his first game back was game four. I, I, I believe it. Yeah. Game four against Boston wasn't very good. And there were questions. All right. looks like the Panthers are going to go back to Alex Lyon because y'all remember Alex Lyon was Florida's starting goalie in the first three games of, of the Boston series gives up three goals in game three. Bobrovsky comes in just to get some game action. They start him game four. You're thinking game five, Alex Lyon goes back in. Paul Marie says, no, I'm not putting the pressure on that guy. He's our AHL goalie. We got a $10 million guy in Sergei Bobrovsky. This is on him. If we're going to win or we're going to lose, he needs to be part of this. And Sergei Bobrovsky has answered the bell. He has been unbelievable since then, since game five, eight and one. And, you know, he gave up five, I think five goals in game six here in sunrise against Boston. Four of them, he didn't have a prayer on. So he was terrific. And that the game he gave up five, he was phenomenal in. Um, and that's kind of been Sergei Bobrovsky the first couple of years here, right? His numbers weren't great, but he was winning games. And a lot of them, you know, you're like, yeah, he didn't have a chance on that. But now he's making the saves on the unbelievable shots, right? I mean, you're seeing things that he's doing. Um, oh, he didn't have a prayer on that one. He made the saves. And that's what you need out of your all-star. Yeah, that's what you need out of a goalie. You need a goalie to make those unbelievable saves and steal you some games. Sergey Bobrovsky stealing the Florida Panthers some games. Last question for you, George. Uh, Sasha Barkov for so long was, you know, just an underrated superstar, uh, you know, does everything so well, but, you know, didn't sure. necessarily get the headlines. Matthew Kachuk, all in your face, all, you know, uh, just, just, just front and center gets all the headlines. You know, how have the two of them sort of been the yin and the yang to each other since, uh, since Kachuk came over from Calgary? I was just about to say they're the yin and the yang. I mean, that's exactly right. <laughs> Barkov is the quiet guy and Kachuk is the look at me. I'm in South Florida, baby. Put the, you know, I'm going to, you know, all that stuff. You know, you just look at how they live. Barkov lives in a little, you know, place in Boca and plays tennis all day. And Kachuk's living in Fort Lauderdale Beach, driving around in a custom golf cart. I mean, that's 
Kachuk, and Barkov. That's what they are. They are two different sides of the spectrum. You see them in the press conferences together, and they just crack each other up because they're so different, but yet they're still the same. All Sasha Barkov wants to do is win, and that's the same for Matthew Kachuk. All he wants to do is win, and um, I think a lot, you know, even when in the Boston series, a lot of a lot of blame was being thrown on Sasha Barkov. Um, turns out he was really, really sick before game one, but he wasn't very effective in the early games of that Boston series. And then Kachuk scores a couple goals and nobody's talking about Barkov anymore. And he's able to now play his defensive game. Nobody can get a puck past Barkov. I mean, <laughs> when you talk about five on five scoring, I think Barkov has given up like one goal in the entire playoffs. Maybe none. I don't know. It's one, it's zero or one goals, five on five, the entire postseason. Um, it, it, it's amazing the, the the game that he plays, but it's not flashy. It's not conducive to, hey, look at this. But hockey people are watching going, did you see the way he came all the way back and not got – that was a breakaway that Barkov just out of nowhere just broke up. That's the stuff he does. Kachuk, again, no shots on goal going into overtime, gets the game winner. Who's, who's, who's on the front page? Kachuk. <laughs> a little more than seven hours from now, game two between the Panthers and the Hurricanes. George Richards and Colby Guy will have it covered in its entirety for Florida. HockeyNow.com. Let those rats fly, George. <laughs> well, well they're in three. Carolina. They're confiscating them, apparently. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, George. Appreciate your time this morning. Enjoy tonight's game. Cheers, George. All Appreciate right, it. Good, good seeing you all. Be good. Yeah, you too. Be well. We'll talk again soon. There he goes, George Richards. Oh, man, he's morning. he's one of the best. Like, we, we had him on back in the, not just the TSN 1290 days, as you know, Drew. We had him back on when we had the show on Red River College Radio. That's how far back we go with George Richards. So, yeah. uh, love having him on. Like, nobody knows the Panthers better than George. It's true. George knows the Panthers top to bottom, covering them for close to 30 years with the Miami Herald before Brent branching well, out on his own with Florida hockey. Now. I don't know if you guys were kind of, obviously, you know, everybody thinks of that 1996 run, right? The Florida Panthers uh, going to the final and then Uwe mm-hmm. Krupp obviously scoring the game winning goal. That, that avalanche team was, I mean, Dave oh, and I have yeah. talked about that avalanche team before, um, you know, Sackett, Forsberg. I mean, yeah. it's just, I mean, we, we know how good that team was. Patty Hua, obviously um, the guy that always sticks out and you drew knows who I'm going to mention here, Ed Jovanovsky. A young Ed Jovanovsky, um, and to me, like Radko oh, Gudis. Yeah, obviously, you know, there's there's other players there. Um, there's, I mean, Dave Lowry. Dave knows, remembers that, um, being a fellow Dave, of course. But no, Lowry. What did Lowry have? He had something like nine or ten goals in, in that run in 1996, right? It was just such a good, like Bill Lindsay is another guy that stands out from that team, Roberts Fela. But Jovanovsky, I, I just love you guys know I love that kind of physical stay-at-home defenseman. He was just so good the way he was throwing his weight around. Um, so I think it's great. I mean, I I, I think the series is long is going to be a long one. Like I don't think the, the Panthers are going to sweep the Hurricanes no. or win in five. I think this is going to be a long series, and I actually still think the Hurricanes are going to win it because they were dominant, uh, especially in that third period. And I would say they were the better team in in overtime. But obviously, all it takes is one turnover, right, guys? But I do think that is going to be an epic series. And of course, we got game two tonight. It should be a good one. Let's head to break one final time. We come back more Jets talk, more hockey talk. Well, whatever is under the sun, we'll discuss in the last segment on this Saturday morning. Drew Mandel, Dave Manuk, Ezra Ginsburg with you. We're live on our social media platforms. We're back on the Illegal Curve Hockey Show. Fun Saturday morning with all of our good friends in the chat and those who are watching us while quietly not venturing into the chat. We love all of you equally and just the same Dave I actually Evans. love Spencey more than other people in the oh. chat. I don't love everyone equally. I, I love everyone equally except for Spencey. He's on a pedestal. Okay, well, good to know. Dave was indicating that he wanted people to smash the like button, so I will uh, interpret what he is saying based on his continued inability to speak I've, without uh, sound. Uh, I've now switched to recall, uh, so we'll see how that works. Well, how, besides Recola. the voice, on how do you feel? Is it like is it a, is it? No, like no, it's 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 it. it. No, no, it's it. no, no. It's just my voice. It's it's literally. I, I haven't shut my mouth for five days. Okay, well, Dave uh, has all set SARS. Uh, that's good. That's good that Dave does not have SARS. On behalf of everybody, Dave, we encourage you to shut your mouth for the rest of the day in about uh, seven and a half minutes' time, uh, or or thereabouts. Yes, the congratulations, Spency. Getting praise from Ezzy, I believe, is the definition of left-handed compliment. Uh, something that you accept, but you're not sure that you want. I'm actually right-handed. Ariel is left-handed. 
Thank you. And my that. dad, my dad, John, the great uh, professor uh, Ginsburg, he's also left-handed, but no, I'm a righty. I'm just a boring righty. Any lefties in your family? Um, my son and daughter uh, are apparently, my son is a left-handed baseball player for some reason. He bats left-handed. No, no, we're he, talking he, about writing. Oh, that's writing? What, not, no, yeah, right that's, that's, that's what determines your dominant hand is the writing. Well, yes, but I mean, I'm saying that it is unique in that my son is is bats left-handed when he plays baseball, but he oh, does everything else yeah. right-handed. Like he shoots in hockey, does he shoot right-handed? Uh, yeah, he shoots right-handed when he plays hockey, also. Yeah. So it's uh, it's odd why he he feels comfortable swinging a bat with his left uh, left-handed. But uh, he's been uh, he's been ripping some dingers, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna get in his way. Well, you know, that, uh, basically, that what it comes down to is Sam's gonna be a much better athlete than his dad. That doesn't say much about at all. I saw somebody was referencing. I think it was Rob Mahoney was was uh, trying to say something about my basketball playing skills, and I can assure you, Rob, uh, that I am one of the world's worst basketball players. It's actually embarrassing. You're I'm definitely you're definitely both Art Schwartz, Drew. You're a chucker. You're a chucker, I, Drew. I, I, cannot play basketball if my life depended on it i have just like no touch whatsoever I, you know i play outside but my son he loves playing basketball and he's you know he's got a pretty good shot pretty good form and i'm hitting the side of the house and missing the backboard entirely it, it's really quite embarrassing but you make up for it with your tennis prowess that's true tennis tennis was my sport he's a very good tennis player good I'm serve good backhand I'm a pretty good. I'm a pretty good. Uh, pretty good golfer, but uh, basketball was is is not my sport, unfortunately. Uh, I was going to say, what do you guys think about what's happening in Toronto? I know Thank we you. Know. We're we're an hour and fifty one minutes into the show. And we I think people talk hold, about hold on, Kyle you know Dubas. What? Hold on, I think we should do a poll. Do people want to talk about what's happening in Toronto, or do people want to focus on the fact that Brad Lambert is the WHL champion? Well, we can do both. We have nine minutes to go, so we can. Hey, as, I'll, see... as you'll do Toronto, I'll talk. Okay, yeah, yeah. Lambert. Let's leave. Okay. The, let's leave the Brad Lambert gushing to to Dave here. But wow, how things have changed over the last four or five days, right? Like yeah. everybody watched Kyle Dubas, you know, talking about his family and everything like that. I, I just feel like this. Like, is this real? Like, it seems surreal to me. Like the way Brendan Shanahan was going into the timeline of like, I don't. I don't think anybody was expecting that, right? So it's unbelievable. And then it, it seemed like you know, I don't know, half an hour later, hour later, uh, Pierre LeBrun. Uh, mentioned that Jason Spezza is out too, right? So you go from the Jason Spezza, Kyle Dubas regime to yeah. now Bre it's just Brendan Shanahan there. And obviously, oh. you know, he's going to have to bring in, you know, Brad a new Trilliving general manager. The, Brad Living is the favorite in the clubhouse. Yeah, it makes yeah. a lot of sense to bring in Brad Living, especially, Drew, because as you know, Brendan Shanahan, when he was asked about, like, what type of GM they're going to bring in, he stressed mm -hmm. veteran experience, right? And so Brad Tree Living, of course, before being the GM of Calgary, he was with the Arizona Coyotes franchise. So he's a guy, he's not a new GM. He's he's a guy that's been around the NHL for a long time, right? So I, I think if it is Brad Tree Living, I mean, it makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I don't think Ron Hextall is going to be the next general manager of the Toronto Maple Leafs. Maybe you guys disagree, but I don't think, you know, what Hextall and, and Brian Burke did in Toronto, um, you know, impressed a lot of people. Obviously, Brian Burke's already had his turn uh, with the Leafs organization. But yeah, tree leaving makes a lot of sense. But I just think, you know, it's it's unfortunate what's happened there. Because, I mean, I think what's being lost in this, Dave, uh, I know you're waiting to, to get in on Brad Lambert and the Seattle Thunderbirds here. By the way, congratulations to the Winnipeg Ice on a, on a great season. I mean, it's unfortunate that they weren't able to win that series and, and go, go to the Memorial Cup. But when you look at that Thunderbird team, I, I mean, it's just, it's so stacked. I mean, everybody knows how many, you know, good future NHLers are on that team. But anyways, getting back to the Leafs, like, it's just unfortunate, Dave, because, you know, the Leafs finally get get over that first round hurdle, right? And obviously, they almost were swept by the Panthers in the next round. And it was disappointing the way they played, you know, especially with the Austin Matthews and Mitch Marner, you know, not, um, you know, putting the puck in the net very much, right? But it's just amazing that this is how the Kyle Dubas regime is going to end in Toronto. I just think it's really unfortunate because I think he's a really bright hockey mind. Yeah, uh, Dave, I, want, I, I just want to make a quick comment is that I would hire Kyle Dubas to be the general manager of my hockey team tomorrow. No questions asked. I think he did a great job in Toronto just because they couldn't. What about uh, Pittsburgh for Kyle Dubas? I, I, I would. Yeah. Pittsburgh, I would. I mean, I don't know if he wants to come back and be the general manager of another team this year this quickly. But no, I Kyle Dubas, I think, is going to be in demand because I think he's a hell of a general manager. Well, and Drew, I was just going to add on the Toronto thing. It's also very weird how it sounded mutual. They had a mutual parting of ways. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden it was like he asked for more money 
And he still wanted to be the GM, but he asked for more money. So then we fired him. Mm-hmm. Like it went quickly from like Kumbaya to Kumbayo. <laughs> like it was, it was completely, thank you. I like that. I like that. Even without the voice, I still got it. Anywho, the point is. You got uh, something. I got something. All right. <laughs> uh, I'll quickly use whatever reserves I have left in my tank. Go to, as, as he said, first of all, congrats to the ice. Cause he did as he, as he's right. Had a hell of a good season. But that Seattle Thunderbirds team was phenomenal. And I think it was a exceptional uh, development experience for the Jets 2022 first rounder. The other 22 first rounder, uh, obviously, Rutger McGordy is one at the University of Michigan. But Brad Lambert, you know, it's not easy for a guy who who's played with men in the Liga, wants to be a Jet, goes to the AHL, does, starts off well, doesn't have a tremendous amount of success. In the AHL, Jacob Stoller of the Hockey News wrote an excellent article. It's in the morning papers today if you want to read it. All about Brad Lambert and what his coaching staff, how they see him. He goes to the WHL. Again, he and Chaz Lucius both got assigned after the World Juniors. Not an easy going to junior, but you're playing with your peers. And I think it was incredibly important for both those players to get that experience, to be able to dominate at that level. Chaz Lucius, we saw it right away with Portland. He was doing it until, unfortunately, had the injury and he his season came to an early end. But Brad Lambert, consistent. He was excellent throughout the regular season. Moved to center. And I talked about it with head coach Mark Morrison, uh, GM Greg Eisinger of the Moose in our end of season roundtable. Talked about how they kind of opened their eyes. Maybe they thought of him as a winger. Now they see him potentially as a center. That's only going to be good for the Jets organization. And that just goes to show you how beneficial it was. And, it, and again, in this instant gratification society we live in, Guy being sent back to junior isn't the end of the world. What I think it did for Brant Lambert is gave him an ex- kid already had confidence. I think it just adds to that because now you've got validation for that confidence. And so for for the Jetson organization from a long term perspective, I think it's it's phenomenal what this has done. And maybe he goes on and has an amazing Memorial Cup. As he, I think they're probably a pretty good um, a pretty good uh, entry there. And there's probably a lot of teams who we I don't follow the OHL QMJHL the way. We follow the WHL a little bit more here in Winnipeg, but um, I, you have to think Seattle's going to be a good, have a good chance to win the Memorial Cup. And that will just go later this month, I should say. So I think that's going to be a, a real good thing for, for Brad Lambert and the Jets organization for his long term uh, goals. Okay. Dave has spoken enough. That's his voice is done. We're going to say good night. Desi's got to get out to the lake before his family and wife murder him. So we're going to say good night. Goodbye. Thank you everyone for joining us this morning. A big thank you to all of our sponsors who make the post game show, the Saturday show, the website, a possibility, our friends at the Rady JCC, their sports dinner coming up June 19th tickets available. RadyJCC.com. rumors, restaurant and comedy club, Linden market, dental center, Zapia group, realty, Bethway, Tough Duck, Boston Pizza, Seagram's, Rollies, Transfer, Grid Park, and The Keg. If you're in town this weekend, Lachlan Patterson, two shows tonight at Rumors, 715, 945. Tickets available, rumorscomedyclub.com. Support these fine businesses because of their continued support of Illegal Curve Hockey. Whatever you're doing this long weekend, folks, please be safe in doing it. And we'll see you back here on Saturday for the next edition of the Illegal Curve Hockey Show. For Dave Manuk, for Ezra Ginsberg, I'm your host, Drew Mandel. If it's Saturday, it's the Illegal Curve Hockey Show. Thanks for listening to this broadcast from Illegal Curve Hockey. For more great Illegal Curve content, subscribe to the Illegal Curve YouTube channel, follow at Illegal Curve on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, And visit your online home for hockey in Winnipeg, IllegalCurve.com.